Computerized Start is brought to you by my awesome patrons on Patreon. And by your tips and memberships on Coffee. These and other channel supporters make my live streams possible. You too can become a channel supporter with tiers starting at just $1. And as always, thank you for all your support, including sharing, chatting, liking, and subscribing. Now roll that famous logo animation! Good evening and welcome back to Computer Ask Start Live. I am your host, Justin D. Morgan. And tonight, it's a PC stream. So I have attempted to clear the workbench of everything Apple. Sorry, Max. Apparently, I failed to remove the keyboard there. And tonight, the PCs get a chance to redeem themselves because Mac made a really poor showing last stream with only a 50% success rate. Mac, I expect better of you. But, before I get too ahead of myself, let's see who we have in the chat. We have Sloopy Malibu, Eric Sedge, Thomas Armstrong, Sad Mac 356, Sorcerer Stan. No, I haven't found any jumpers yet. Dave's Vintage Apple Tech. And Frank S. Jack 68K. Welcome, everyone. The stream needs more Apple. Well, that'll be another stream. Because remember, uh, PCs for spread spreadsheets and pie charts and like boring stuff. So I've printed manuals here. So let's see here. Channel announcements. The Tuesday will be the SGI stream. I also forgot to remove the SGI from my workbench, so it's like right below me, but it's not making an appearance tonight. Promise. Uh, yeah, if you wanted more Apple, that was last stream and future streams. Tonight, I've got a plethora of PCs to work on. Forgot to create a disc for the Packard Bell. Oh, well, moving on. Let's see here. Coffee. I have a new coffee goal. You can see the bar is feeling kind of low right now. And links in the description. Always glad you're joining here. Be sure to smash that like button. Subscribe if you aren't already. Because if you're a subscriber, you can participate in the chat. Have all sorts of fun with everyone else. And let's see here. Yes, also, I had hoped I would have some parts tonight. But I also finally figured out YouTube's, not YouTube, eBay's. Method of how they come up with an estimated arrival time and as a seller, it disappointed me because basically I sold something last night. I got an offer. I accepted the offer on the item and I see the email that they're telling me the we've told the buyer that it'll arrive between such and such a date. So please be sure to mail this by such a date. And I look at the dates. I'm like, wait a minute. So you're telling me to mail it by the date I gave you for processing time. But knowing where the spire is, you've calculated the arrival time based on if I mail it, like, right now. Okay. No wonder I seem to be getting so much stuff late. So, eBay, if you're watching, which I know you're not, but if you're watching as a seller, I'm disappointed that you're telling buyers incorrect dates to expect your item by because well i bought something this past weekend it was like you told me oh you'll have it by thursday no seller had a processing time seller mailed it on time but no if they mailed it on time then i won't get it by thursday and i don't have it today so oh well moving on what part did i order well it was a real-time clock chip I'll probably need it tonight, and I don't have it. I may have to steal one from another computer. But first, I'm going to start with a, everyone's favorite computer. Or motherboard, in fact, actually. This motherboard would be part of Team Red, apparently. Because 
Apparently, this motherboard has a nickname. This motherboard would be the AMD Fanboy motherboard. Yes, the Expert Board 4044VL. The AMD Fanboy. But actually, I did figure out why it was being such an AMD Fanboy, and it's actually interesting. So, this is the board I took to RetroTech Chris's. One of them, I did some debugging there, and I figured out at Chris's house that the keyboard controller was bad. Apparently, with the replacement keyboard controller, which is this nice Via Technologies. Let's see, the replacement is a Via Technologies VT82C42N. Luckily, it seems to work. The original was a Winbond W83C42. Actually, a lot of these controllers are just clones of IBM's original keyboard controller, which was an Intel, which was based on an Intel 8042 microcontroller. So a lot of them are compatible. Now, I do know someone was asking me in a comment on a video, well, aren't the BIOS and keyboard controller tied together sometimes? And yes, I believe some of the keyboard controllers are tied with the BIOS. I do believe if you had a Mr. BIOS on a motherboard, then you could get a Mr. BIOS keyboard controller for better performance. I think some of them may be more tightly coupled. And it, then, of course, at some point, the keyboard controller got migrated into the chipset. That was probably late in the game. I don't think this one wasn't integrated yet. And that was like a kind of a stopgap before pretty much everything became USB anyways. And then there is no keyboard controller. Or there might be a one controlling the PS2 ports. But anyways, this motherboard actually likes Intel processors now that the keyboard controller's been replaced. Although I don't think it's a necessarily... Well, also, for the record, this motherboard actually doesn't like uh, the AMD 5x86. But so, even though it's got the nickname of the AMD fanboy motherboard, it has its limits, apparently. So... Anyways, what have I for this board? So last time I did put the Intel DX266 processor in here. Or actually, wait a minute. Where was I looking at this board? I think I might have actually been looking at this board on Dave's stream. So I was just trying to sort things out. So what have I done to this board since it was last on my channel? All right. I figured out the keyboard controller was bad. The way I figured that out is Chris and I were just trying various things. So we had the computer on for a while because we were running benchmarks and doing other things. And then at some point after the computer had been on for 10 minutes, which I have to admit, I didn't let it run that long when I was using it on, I think, on my last stream. I don't think it ran that long. It would start to lose characters when you typed or it would act like the control key was that you hit like control and the letter, which I was, that was at first it was like subtle. And I thought, oh, I'm a bad typist. But I think eventually Chris and I both caught on about the same time. But wait a minute. No, I really am hitting keys because we heard the key go down and. It would like not register or it would act as if I hit control in that key because we'd get some weird control character finally and then we thought to well, well let's try to run windows and well that failed miserably because windows switched the a20 line but anyways replace the keyboard controller windows will now run on it so i have decided that because this motherboard is still kind of particular and i can't put the amd 5x86 in it that i've decided to re Focus this build, and it's no longer going to be the sleeper 486 build. That will be a different 486 motherboard. Although it may not be sleeper because I don't know that I'll have a case for it. Or maybe I will put it in the uh, the AT clone case. This I may have another motherboard, I, uh, another case I can put this build in. But I decided that. So I decided that this board for this build 
was going to get my IBM Blue Lightning processor. And because this is also a DX266, now basically it's based on the Cyrix. Now I haven't tested this. This processor may just spectacularly not work in this board, earning this board the nickname of AMD Fanboy. But I decided I was going to put the Blue Lightning processor in here. So even if it was going to be the a DX266 build, as kind of like this will be my mid range 486 build. At least I would get the slight added performance boost because I think the Blue Lightning might have a little, little extra cash. I'm not totally sure. But I don't know. We can, we can actually run some comparative benchmarks here. But it's going to get the Blue Lightning processor anyways, if the board likes it, because that'll let me keep my, I, my Intel processor available for swapping into boards to test them. Whereas I can leave the blue lightning in, in this build. So at least I'll have the, I'm just kind of cleaning the, cleaning the processor off. Cause I'll put a heat sink on it. Keep it cool. Anyways, I do need to check. So I printed out the jumpers just so I wasn't having to keep looking back and forth. Oh, wait. Before I change jumpers, excellent. Uh, the one other thing I did to this board, so I think on a previous live stream, I had tried to upgrade the cache to 256K, and that failed. It, like, the motherboard became really unstable. Well, turns out, once I replaced the keyboard controller, that the, the, the cache, the same exact cache chips I tried to use before work great. So somehow that was caused by the keyboard controller too. So yeah, if you have a 486 motherboard or even maybe a 386 or 286 or XT or one that has a keyboard controller on it, if you start seeing weird glitchy issues, especially if they culminate in loss of keystrokes or phantom keys, for example, it was acting like I was pressing control when I wasn't, or if Windows crashes out with a stack dump, especially if it looks like it might have been about the point where it's it went into protected mode, because the keyboard controller on a lot of these boards, in fact, I think on this board it does, the keyboard controller controls the A20 line on the processor. The brief summary of what the A20 line is, is the original IBM XT supported up to a mega memory addressing uh, that was the uh, address limit because 640K is all you need, plus then 384K for your map IO and ROMs and whatnot. Or I guess it's really ROM space. So at the top of one megabyte on those machines, because it had 20, I guess 20 address lines, if you addressed... Okay, the one other thing Intel processors do, which is different from some platforms, is the addressing is done by segment and offset. So there is a segment register that defines which segment you're addressing, and then you have an offset into that segment. Well, anyways, on the original XT, if you were accessing the top from the top segment of memory and you went past in the offset register the what would be the actual top of memory because there was uh 20 address lines it would wrap around back to zero there were programs although i would contend badly written programs that took advantage of that wrap around so the at comes out it supports more memory more than one megabyte and IBM, while they're designing it, they're like, oh, no, what if you're in real mode and you're running programs that were depending on this wraparound? Well, now we have more than 20 address lines. What do we do? Oh, look, we have a spare, I, uh, a spare output or in, I think it's an output on the, the keyboard controller. Well, let's use that to control the A20 line. So if you're in real mode, you get the wraparound. And well, before you go to protected mode, you just have to make sure you enable the A20 line so that it doesn't wrap around and well 
And therefore, thanks IBM, that's how a keyboard controller, if it's failing and it doesn't switch the A20 line or doesn't do it in a timely fashion, well, Windows, you're going to start Windows, it's going to go to protected mode. Memory is going to be wrapping around like it shouldn't. And, or, well, you're, the address line 20 is not going to be acting correct. Oh, well, you're going to crash out of Windows. The big fat stack dump. Or, um, yeah, it'll, it'll like, yeah, you'll know it. You'll see a bunch of what looks like gobbledygook to um, anyone but a geek that knows the names of the registers on a 32-bit Intel processor. So, yeah, you know when it crashes out like that, you got a big problem. Anyways, yeah. So, luckily, I realized that, okay, Windows is crashing when you try to start it with a stack dump. I'm losing keys. I've got a phantom key pressed. Well, by golly, Chris, I think I got a bad keyboard controller. But, of course, I didn't bring keyboard controllers with me up to Chris's house. Maybe next time I will bring one just in case, because now I know, yeah, we'll find a bad keyboard controller at Chris's house. <laughs> so anyways, I replaced the keyboard controller and apparently the cache works. So how the two are related, I don't know. It could have had something to do with the, the maybe when it, the BIOS tried to test the A20 line on the keyboard controller, that was the extra cache was doing something. I don't know. Hey, Rudy, welcome. And Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy, I've got your uh, blue lightning processor in this board. So we're going to try this real quick. So anyways, now that I've explained the upgrades I've done, the, the cache is upgraded. I replaced the keyboard controller. I did figure out that this motherboard does not like 32 megabytes of RAM. If you have 256K of cache, there's like something wrong with the chipset and uh, that causes uh, memory test failures. If you're running a memory check test tool, it'll pass BIOS, but... Oh, hey, RetroTechie. Anyways, so I decided for this build, I'm only going to put 16 megabytes of RAM in it so that I have the full 256K of cache. Also, for this build, I am going to use my Mach 64 Visa Local Bus video card. Very nice card. Yes, I know if... um. Ryan's lurking and is running the keyboard like, not a Trident! Well, if you saw how good this Mach 64 card is, you'd know why I'm not using a Trident card. So, and yes, if anyone's wondering, and uh, I'm having a better day today. I was feeling, I was in a crummy mood Tuesday. I am feeling, I am doing better today. My week is improving. 16 megabytes should be fun. But you know, we want to max it out. Then again, I'm not action retro, so I don't need to max it out. At least not this board. I'll max out a different board. All right. Now, the one thing I do need to do, because I just changed CPU types, is I need to double check the jumpers. And actually, I think I will try to use the motherboard guide for this. Even though the... Scan of the ma manual on the retro web is has some readability issues. So, anyways, I had in the board a 486DX2, and I believe for this board it's jumpered with these settings. And to go to the IBM Blue Lightning, I believe the IBM Blue Lightning is. Sire, uh, going to be Cyrix M7 derivative. Because I believe the M Cyrix M6 is the DX. I think the Cyrix M7 is the DX2. I, I was trying to do some research really quickly before the stream. So I think for this Blue Lightning processor, I need to change the jumpers to match this, which of course seems to be mostly completely different from the 486DX, including I'm going to have to find a jumper. And then I, I think, though, the frequency setting is going to be correct because this is a DX2, so that should be correct. But I do need to check these jumpers here real quick. Uh, don't worry, Jeremy. I have a fan. I, I wasn't going to depend on this motherboard's nickname of being the AMD Fanboy Motherboard, as depending on it to keep it cool. 
Now, the question is, where did the... Oh, okay, I see where the fan went. So, yes, this CPU does need a fan. The name Blue Lightning could have probably accurately also been called uh, Blue Fire because these things, Cyrix processors run hot. Cyrix processors, you could say that again. Cyrix processors run hot. I could say that again. Cyrix processors run hot. I think the one thing Cyrix didn't get was how to make a cool running processor because even, even the Cyrix like Pentium level ones ran hot. In fact, I bet the Media GXs ran hot. I think every Cyrix processor runs hotter than its AMD and Intel counterparts change my mind. I think if you do the research, I think my supposition is probably nearly correct in most every case, although I don't, I've never used a Media GX to know that, but yeah, I've got a fan, so don't worry. Yes, Jeremy's telling me the CPU came from Italy. Although, in reality, I believe it's the same uh, same processor that uh, you would have bought in the U.S. Uh, actually, oh, okay, so IBM didn't mark it. It says uh, Copyright USA 1993 Cyrix on it. Actually, if you want to know the truth, Jeremy, I, I highly suspect that this processor was made in IBM's Fabrication facility in New York, if I had to guess, was then exported to Italy to then get re-imported back into the U.S. Although there might have been even more travels there, too. But <laughs> So if anything, Jeremy, you repatriated it because I suspect this was probably made in their fab in New York because that's where they were making a lot of processors back in the day. I mean, I think they might have had some other fabs, but. Uh, I don't remember when they opened, but they did have a facility up in somewhere in New York, and I suspect this is uh was made there. I think that fab actually still exists. I think Global Foundries owns it now, because I think IBM sold all their fabs to Global Foundries and leases uh leases space. But yeah, <laughs> yay! Uh, Jeremy's like, hey, yay us. <laughs> All right, let me check these jumpers here real quick. I've got the motherboard jumper guide to hopefully not steer me wrong. I'm sure it will so steer me wrong because it's some of these pages are not really that readable. Okay, so JP5 and JP6 should actually be correct already because those are the same for, yeah, the same for the M7 and the DX2. Okay, JP8. And JP19 on this board should also be, well, this is why I'm checking them, because I think I just, uh... so let's see, JP8, oh yeah, JP8 should be 1 and 2, JP19 is, ooh. Actually in the wrong jumper position. Oh, I must have I must have tried something after and then just put the DX2 back. So JP24 is also one and two. Yes. For anyone getting into retro computing, it's not always fun. Sometimes you actually have to decipher poorly scanned jumper manual uh, jumper guides or in this case it's part of the user manual sometimes you even have to uh, bend the pins that you probably accidentally bent like a klutz by doing something silly there we go all right jp wait a minute is that right yeah jp24 i'm just Yep, JP24 is 1 and 2. JP39 is... Yep, that one right there. 
know if anyone's wondering, these jumpers are not in numerical order. So it is quite entirely possible I will have gotten one of these wrong. And then JP43 is off, which it is. All right, there we go. Okay. Is there? Yeah. All right. Oh, and let me check the speed jumpers real quick here before I forget. So JP3 is on. JP4 is off. And then JP17 is on. Okay, we're good. Oh, you couldn't see that. All right. So we got the jumpers. Jumpers are correct. I have, um, actually, is that a 486 heatsink? Oh, actually, here we go. All right. I don't know how well this heatsink works, but I'll use it because it'll just neatly clip in. Okay, let's see here. Oh, all right. Let me find video cable before I forget to plug that in. I'll grab the keyboard. And I need to find the Adapter for my power supply. Which I probably set to the side. Because last stream I was using the power supply, or I was using a different power supply last time I was powering PCs up. So hold please while I locate the item that I forgot to make sure I knew where it was before the stream because oh, what would be the fun of streaming when you know where everything is? Or I may end up just grabbing the... Oh, interesting. All right. Did I? I have no idea what that is, Jeremy. Oh, here's the adapter. I hope that is not a car. I don't know what that component is. You're going to have to uh, at least tell me what component category that is. All right. Oh, let's see here. And the compact flash card I set to the side during the Mac stream because I didn't need it on now. I gotta find it. Let's see here. I put it actually. Probably put it somewhere really creative because I had actually borrowed the jumpers off of it at one point during that stream. Oh. 
Sure that component, uh, Jeremy. You sure that component's not like a clone of some seventy-four series logic chip? Because it seems to be how a lot of those Soviet chips worked. I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them were like clones of other chips. No, it's not fixed yet, Retro Techie. I can't find the uh, my compact flashcard reader. Because, of course, it wouldn't be one of my live streams if I knew where everything was all the time, the whole time through the stream. Because even if I clean my workbench, I'll be looking for things all night. I would say you could place your guesses in the chat as to where I'll find it, but I'll get like 15 people telling me you'll find it in the last place you put it. I've tried that before to come up with creative places where I can look to see if I put something. No, it is not in my ultrasonic cleaner. Oh, hey, Mike. Yeah, it's a PC. This is a PC stream. Mike, I think you came to the right place and, uh, Oh, there's my compact flash card. Now, the interesting thing that I figured out about this Visa Local Bus controller card last time I was using it is apparently this controller card supplies power on the pin that sometimes supplies power. So I can power this computer up. And notice that my compact flash card has power. And there we go. Oh. It does help when I switch the scaler to the correct input. Uh, yeah, well, Mike, I think when I got the Visa Local Bus card, I hadn't decided which computer it would go in. But yes, uh, this computer is the one I'm putting my... Visa local bus video card in. Yeah, I know. I uh, that is very uncommon, which is why I was surprised that it worked. Uh, I only discovered it because I'd accidentally forgot to plug the power cable in. I let the computer boot. And then I, of course, look on the bench. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I forgot to plug the power in and I realize it's already in DOS. I'm like, oh, it's powered. Well, I know Cyrix can be bad, but I want, I want to see. Uh, this is that a Cyrix processor that came on a motherboard that Jeremy bought from Italy. So basically, I figured out that this processor was probably fabricated in IBM's factory in, oh, Okay, um, although the Visa Local Bus controller supplies power to the IDE device, uh, the GoTech is not powered by the floppy cable. <laughs> Actually, Jeremy, I think this board hated Intel because the Intel processors I had were fast enough to see the problem with the keyboard controller. Now that I've replaced the keyboard controller, it's fine with Intel processors, but unfortunately... Once a board earns its nickname, it's hard to lose it. And yeah, this is the Intel fanboy motherboard or the AMD fanboy motherboard. So um, now I know Cyrix can be bad, but I, I want to see if Cyrix is indeed bad here. Uh, also, I'm kind of partially doing this because of this on the silk screen. So I'm trying to do everything I can to not do that in this build. 
I'm like, well, I don't have an AMD DX266. That'd be the other reason. All right. Oh, uh, fun fact. If you pull out your modern keyboard and type CD space DOS bench enter, nothing will happen. All right, let's see here. So check CPU and oh, interesting. Enabled in right through mode. Well, I may, um, oh, this may be a reason why I may go back to the uh, Intel processor. Yeah, yeah, this isn't a 486 SLC. This is actually uh, the 486 DX. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't have an AM. Uh, I, the only one I have is the DX4 120, and that's too close to the other build I'm going to do that's 486, so... I don't need two computers that are so close in speed. Especially because Visa Local Bus sometimes really doesn't like 40 megahertz. Yeah, yeah, this, this one's not a bad process. Yeah. Uh, the, this controller does not let me use a one gigabyte card. That's actually what this card is. So this is a Promise IDE card that has a BIOS on it. So this card is letting me use the one gigabyte card. Yeah, this controller card depends on the PC BIOS and this PC BIOS is limited to 500 megabytes. All right, so We'll have some comparative numbers. I'll probably put the Intel 486 back in to run the comparative numbers, which will mean I'll have to. Although, oh, wait a minute. You know, I think I might have missed a jumper now that I think about it. Hold on. Let me, let me see here. It's power management. Other jumpers. Oh, let's see here. JP34. Where's JP? All right, while we run some benchmarks, I'm going to take a look at the position of JP34, which is 1 and 2. Oh, I may need to go check the BIOS setting here. Okay. All right, we see both caches. That's good. Let me, let me go back into BIOS here and check a setting. Oh yeah, that five yeah, that five hundred megabyte limit is Yeah, that's also why I've got no drives configured because the, the promise BIOS handles it for me. Let me see here. Internal, external memory. Okay, I can't use okay. Maybe this board doesn't actually Oh, here we go. Ah, there we go. I think this is the first processor I've put in the system that actually let me set that to right back. Granted, I think the Intel processor, it may just be on automatically. I don't remember that setting be, being there for the Intel. And I don't think it was there for the AMD, so... Oh, scared me there for a moment. I thought I locked up. Anyways, here we go. This uh, Promise Technology EIDE Max controller. I tried to actually put this BIOS onto another card, but uh, apparently there's some sort of... Uh, it doesn't work unless it's in this particular card. So... It's probably looking for some... Oh, yeah, it does look like there's like a gal or something on that card. So I bet it is looking for the presence of the gal or something. There we go. I'm in right back mode. Woo! -hoo! 
Let me see. So is the cash going to be faster? Cool. No, actually, it's not faster. Weird. Yeah, actually, interestingly enough, this is a generic controller card, a generic Visa Local Bus controller card that has a Promise IDE controller on it. And then this is just a Promise 16-bit IDE. It's an EIDE Max. But you don't have to use its IDE controller. But at least this would let me, I could turn it on and have a secondary IDE for an optical drive or something which I probably will do. But uh, the nice thing is, though, it will, the BIOS will work for both primary and secondary. Yeah, pr promise cards are good. I will enjoy this one. So yeah, I'm going to use this, even though it's just a generic card with a promise controller. Hey, it's a promise controller. So that stays in the build. The Mach 64. Ah. Hey, I8386SX. Welcome. Yes, I think I'll have good times with this machine. Okay, I, I doesn't, you can't really tell right back is enabled for some reason, but I mean, it might be a scotch faster. Interestingly enough, this program's having trouble telling what clock speed it is. Okay, 66.1. But let's try the important things. Let's see here. Can we run Doom? See, we got important things we got to do with 486 systems. Can it run Doom? I will also try to run Quake because I found Quake is a good test to make sure that it's actually stable. Granted, it's probably really not playable on a 66 megahertz. But I have figured out that if Quake doesn't run, you might have a stability problem. Because it will at least, should launch on a 486. Oh! Thank you. I forgot to change it to capture it back to the capture input. Yeah, I yep. Feel free to say something sooner if you think I meant to switch to capture or to table cam. Yeah, Quake will be a stretch, but uh, I mean it should run. It'll run like a dog. Uh, and. Honestly, in this case, when run like a dog, I think they mean, uh, must mean Basset Hound. And anyone that's owned a Basset Hound will know. There's very few things a Basset Hound will run for. Most of the time they're sleeping. Yeah, Doom will run nicely on this. I mean, Doom's running pretty nicely on this CPU. Twenty-one thirty-four game ticks and thirty-five oh one real ticks. Not sure what that is in frames per second, but not not a bad score for this computer. Oh, let me go back. So check CPU if anyone's wondering. So I got right back enabled. <laughs> Jeremy run runs like a square bracket lame dog. Yeah. Oh, and then cash check was well. I guess I'll repeat that for everyone's benefit. Also, because I think I was actually capturing the output with the uh, before I turned on right back. But the important thing is, though, I've got 256k of cash, and if you'll notice, the the way you read this is so from 1248k, you'll see it's 20 microseconds per kilobyte. So that's the 8k of L1 cash. And then you'll see 1632, 64, 128, 256K. So 256K is the L2 cache. You'll see 24 microseconds per kilobyte. But then you'll see the fall off at 512K block because now it's got to go out to memory and performance falls off. So it is showing that 
for the whole 16 megabytes of memory I have in this computer. And basically now it's just right, it's seeing the no, same numbers. So it's just going to print that they're the same for the rest of these. So this, at least this motherboard, uh, this motherboard actually will cache 32 megabytes with 256K of cache. However, there's some wonky addressing thing that happens and memory tests fail. And that tells me that if you use, if you actually manage to fill memory, you're probably going to run into trouble because there's something up with 256K of cache and 32 megabytes of memory where like the last 384K of memory doesn't work, but you can still address it. So that's why I'm not going to put 32 megabytes in this board. I'll keep with 16 because I decided... And Tech Ambrosia convinced me, uh, because she was on Dave's stream, that was like, you know, I would go for the maximum amount of cash, and 16 megabytes is great for 46. I'm like, you know, that logic works. So now that I have run Doom and you saw the last half, which told you what you needed to see. All right. I do know that there's no sense in me running the... Uh, 640 by 480 quake time demo. I mean, I might try it, but the important thing is quake did quake did launch because I have noticed on uh, if I've got a combination where the processor is not working or actually even in um, when I had the old keyboard controller in quake was not happy. Because I think Quake, though, switches to protected mode. I thought Doom did, too, but maybe not. Oh, hey, Francois. Yeah, yeah, 16 megabytes is good for a 46 or even an early Pentium. Yes, I'd agree. So, uh, in fact, I've got a build that I'll be working on for a video... Yeah, this is actually working better than I would have expected, too. I suspect the graphics card is probably helping. Some. But yeah, I've got a build I'm working on where... I think I decided I was just going to use the memory that came with the motherboard. And it is, I guess, an, it'll be an early Pentium build. Yeah, so I don't forget. It, it might have 32 megs in it because that's what came with the board. I was like, it's like, I'm not going to buy more memory because the board had memory and it, it looks, uh, um, it, it'll look the part. <laughs> wow. 3 a.m. Francois. Actually, Jeremy, I was reading that apparently at least when IBM manufactured the Cyrix processors for as blue lightning processors. Although it may be the case when even the Cyrix ones that I, IBM manufactured for Cyrix, IBM had better quality control than I guess some of the other fabs that were manufacturing Cyrix processors. So the, these blue lightning processors were made by IBM. They would have been under that stricter quality control. So they have uh, better tolerances. So it would not surprise me if, uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if IBM might have made some slight tweaks for performance too. After all, I think on the Intel processors that were private labeled as IBM processors, which IBM, in their agreement though, was IBM had to sell them in a system. So that's why you never saw them as loan processors on the market, but I, uh, IBM made tweaks to Intel's design, and they were actually, uh, like, a bit faster. So, Yeah, Jeremy says he ran Windows 98 Second Edition on that CPU. Well, yeah. I mean, it was not my first choice for what I'd run Windows 98 Second Edition on, but this is also not my first choice for uh, Quake platforms, because that's 5.5 frames per second. But, I mean... It is a 486DX266. Now, if we really want to see uh, Struggle City, we'll uh, we'll run this 640 by 480 time demo. 
And this will be where we'll test my, uh... Oh, wow, yeah. You know, actually, I think that first one might have been this... I don't think that setting's working. Okay, at least the one good thing is I'm kind of touching the heatsink now that it's been running. Uh, yeah, I think the heatsink's keeping the processor nice and cool. Ah, uh, Jeremy's saying 66 megahertz and 16 megs of RAM is the bare minimum for Windows 98 Second Edition. Yeah. Uh, Windows, I have found that Windows 95 and above are not really the operating systems you want to run on the bare minimum. I mean, Windows 95 will run on a 386DX processor. That's the bare minimum. It's not that great on a 386DX. Yes, I know it will run on a 386SX. You can disable the hardware check and it it will install. It will run like a lame dog. But yeah. Now, this, this system is actually going to be... I'm just going to leave DOS and... It'll be DOS on Windows 3.1. I mean, I might, I might be convinced to dual boot Windows 95 because I, I know, I know how Chris does his dual booting and I might give that a try sometimes uh, because if I run into a bind, Chris can probably uh, point me in the right direction. Also, if you ever see Chris boot up one of his LTE laptops, and you see the boot menu, yeah, um, I forget what it's called right offhand. I've got it written down somewhere, but. Oh, okay, Jeremy says he ran Windows 95 on a 386SX40 without any hacking. Okay. Yeah, uh, oh, that's, okay, I don't think Windows 95 can tell SX from DX because there was no CPU ID. So, yeah, it, it will run without any hacking, but if you look at the official minimum system requirements, it's a DX. That's the official minimum requirement, it, it, but it can't tell SX from DX because there's no CPU ID on the processors. I mean, they probably could tell them apart, but I mean, I'm sure there's a way you could write a program to tell the two apart. I think there are utilities that can tell the two apart, but it's not through a CPU ID register. So yeah, Windows 3.1 is probably a good operating system for this oh good night Rudy yeah no problem comes down to running Windows 3.1 uh, Jeremy would rather run DOS shell well there are a few Windows 3.1 games that are kind of neat so I probably will ha oh, I mean I already have Windows 3.1 installed on this compact flash card so there are a few Windows 3.1 games that are neat. Retro Techie's asking, can this play Crisis? Well, let's find out. No, it cannot run Crisis. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's see here. We'll run a few more benchmarks because everyone likes it. I want you to note... This video card here has a really nice picture on it. I was actually kind of worried when I bought it because uh, actually I had actually tried Chris's Mach 64 card on this board. And you, there, you can actually on Chris's Mach 64 board, you can actually see faint uh, uh, jail bars. So... We, we tried this one out, and Chris and I were both like, wow, that's a nice image. 41.6 frames a second. That's not bad. Uh, I'm going to skip Chris's 3D benchmark because the, the orb, the floaty orb is just boring. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw this away. This is actually a, a good system here. Actually, it's not doing too bad on PC player benchmark. I mean, yeah, it's uh, stuttery, but this is a demanding benchmark. 
Uh, it's three point something. It's off screen for both of us. Three point something. Uh, actually, it's not too bad for a 66. Yes, it's a nice VGA card. Okay, Ran Doom or Ran Quake. I guess the other one that will run is uh, the uh, Speed Sys. I know this is one Adrian runs as well. So, yeah, that's a nice VGA card. It'll make a nice addition to this system. So, hopefully this is going to land somewhere like right above the DX250 line. Which is going to be the second one on the bottom. Yep. Yep, it is... Uh, 26.74 and it's like right over that. Yeah, that's actually that's actually performing maybe a little better than I thought it would. Oh yeah, and my Mach 64 has two megabytes of memory on it, so very nice. Yeah, I am glad Chris uh, picked this video card up and handed it to me and said, Justin, you need to buy this. <laughs> yeah so uh jeremy this motherboard would probably run 24 megabytes of memory i can actually let me see i know i've got an eight megabyte module somewhere question is do i have it handy oh that's a four megabyte those are all sd ram that's a pile of trident video cards that won't work in this computer unless i jerry rig agp slots that's a four i think that's a four yeah, let me see. I've got an 8 megabyte module around here somewhere if I can find it real quick while this speed sys runs. Mm. Oh, here we go. Oh yeah, here we go. I, I've got an 8 module here. It came from the swap meet. Well, it is an EDO module. So it may not work in this board. Some EDO modules will actually run fine in fast page mode. Some won't. Uh, I don't know if that module is one that will run in fast page mode. So I'll give it a try. Uh, it may not work. But let me see. I think I've got another. I think I've got another eight here somewhere. Hmm. It might actually be in a Mac. All right, well, this finishes it for me. That's 32. Oh, that's a Well, I just found the uh, matching module to the one I've got in this board here. I've been looking for it. It was, it was actually staring me in the face every time I went upstairs. Okay, that's so. If you hold on just a moment, we'll actually try this with 24 megs. Okay, so there we go. There's speed sys. That actually looks looks reasonable. Uh, let's see here. I think that's a, that's actually a 16. I don't know what that is. That's a 16. I have lots of fours and I have lots of 16s. Actually, these might be eights. 
I think eights are usually double sided. But not always. Okay. Let's, um. All right. Let's see if this board will run with the. Now, I don't know if this will work for two reasons. One, this this board may not be, may not have the correct, I guess, internal route or, or routing on it to, like, make an EDO memory module be in EDO mode, or in fast page mode. This board also in the user manual does not list a. 8 and a 16 as a combination that it supports. But then again, I've noticed that it does sometimes support... It's supported combinations before that's not in the manual, so... Alright, let's see what it does with uh, these two modules. And that would be, that would be a complete fail. So for anyone that noticed, that counted up to 2 megabytes of memory. Oh. Oh, I don't think it likes that module. All right, let me try one of these. I think these are fast page. Okay. But I don't remember if they're fours or eights or sixteens or what they are. Um, okay, that's weird. Okay, let me make, let me make sure it at least still counts up to 16 with that 16 module. All right, let me look the manual. See, uh, I, I think I may have our answer, Jeremy. I think the answer is no. This board does not seem to like... Okay, so I can install... I can install two eights to get 16, yeah. I can install 16 megabytes in 30, no. I can install a 16 megabyte 72 pin sim and four megabytes of 30 pin sims for 20. Or I can install a 16 and a four in the 72 pin sim sockets. But sure enough, the table of supported memory so there's two different tables. So there's the first table. 24 is not listed. And I think I just proved it does not like 24. I could do 20. I bet I could do 20 though. If I put the two modules in the correct slots. But if I go to, if I change the jumper for table two, then that's still no, because uh, that you basically you have to use matching modules in both slots or singles. So I could probably put twenty in here, but that's a lot of work. That it, that's a lot of work for a little reward to find a. 
four megabyte sim in here that's fast page. Yeah, nope. It's not going to like 24. Probably what I'm going to do is, because I'd like to run this board in parity mode, just in case RAM goes bad. I'll probably get two 8 megabyte parity modules that are the right type for it. And we'll just go with that. So anyways, for anyone wondering. So, it runs Windows. It runs Windows quite nice. Now, I don't have the Mach 64 drivers installed, but... I could run Bib, I could have more visual memory. So, let's see here. But yeah, that's the, the 486. Now, if I was really enterprising, I could remember where I put my Pico Dust. Because that is the easiest sound card to run at the moment. Uh, one moment, please, while I see if Run away. It's nice to do that. It's probably. Oh, nope, that's not it. That's my postcard. You would think that a red PCB would help me find it, but no. Of course not. Because I was going to uh, plug it in and, uh, well. Well, I don't, I don't have it handy, so, all right. So, that's the 486. I was, I am so tempted to, I think I've decided which case I want to put it in, so. Hmm. Wondering if I should go upstairs and yeah, Mike, uh, that that PCB could be fuchsia, and us nerds would still miss it. Yeah. Yep, yeah, you're right there. All right. I'm actually tempted to. Oh, it's only nine thirteen. And for once, I have something that seems to be working. I am kind of tempted to go upstairs and grab the case that I was thinking of putting this in. So I was, I'd initially planned to put this build back in the XT clone case. But. So that could be kind of cool to put this in the case that the 
Pentium, I got extra slot meat again. Hmm, decisions, decisions. So I've got a, so I've got a case that I thought of putting the 386 board in, but I broke the the plastic sticker, for lack of a better word, because it was more like a like a hard plastic than a sticker. It was the part that goes in the inset on the case that says the that has the legend for the LEDs and the clear opening for the megahertz display and whatnot. Well, I broke it trying to get it out to get the turbo button out of the case because the turbo button in the case is broken. So kind of makes me not want to put the 386 in that case because I was hoping to have a turbo button. Of course, this motherboard's got a turbo switch too. So also that case, I think really needs a three pin turbo switch. It's an older style case. Hmm. Anyways, I'm thinking I may put this in. I've got a, a desktop case that I got recently, and maybe that's what I'll put this in. Because it's got a megahertz display. It's a two digit one, so I don't want to put the. Uh, of course, it'd be a cool case for the. 386. This is my quandary. I haven't decided what that case looks like. Because it looks new enough that it could be a 486, but it also looks retro enough that it could be a 386. Uh, it's got a two-digit display on it, so I don't think it was really intended for a Pentium board. Although, quite honestly, it looks like you could jam a Pentium in it and it would still feel at home. It's the, even, I mean, even they put three-digit speed displays on cases and so I'm trying to think what case do I want to put this in the only thing is the power supply in that uh, case I've got upstairs I haven't been able I haven't checked it yet so it could have issues but I could put a power supply in it that I've rebuilt huh I don't know. Decisions, decisions. All right, let me let me see. So All right. Let me uh I think my chat is uh Oh, I think my OBS chat is wonky tonight test by fire yeah y'all probably know i don't like testing by fire so here's my choices at least choice number one well choice number one i put this in the at clone case but i was thinking of putting my other 486 build in the the at clone case because then it would really be a sleeper build okay case number two Okay, this case is a bit grubby on the bottom, but I think it'll clean up. And this power supply does work. Uh, it's a 230-watt power supply, so it'd probably be a little better. Unfortunately, it's got a um, faceplate that doesn't uh, match. But it's the one I got at the swap meet for 5 bucks. So there actually is no megahertz display in it, but there is the opening for one. So I may I may have some PCBs made if I can find the one that'll fit the the whole the screw locations on the backside. I do kind of like the case badge, and I have been very tempted to take a very good picture of it and send it to Geek and Spiel and say, uh, you like it? Does it meet your criteria for maybe replicating it? Is Max technology. I don't know if this one says is saying 486 or Pentium or what. Yeah, it's Max technology, not Min technology. Yeah. So this one may not be because I actually 
we'll probably keep this case badge in it because I actually like it because it's one of the it's one of the brushed metal ones and it's actually I think that actually is brushed metal and not um and not like plastic so I am going to keep this case badge on this case so so this one I'm kind of thinking this might actually be cool to keep as a pinium of some sort especially because it's got the the slightly beefier power supply it uh, doesn't have a megahertz display so I could maybe make one that has three digits and and it's got the max technology badge on it so it's like and yeah okay that faceplate is kind of yellowed but I mean overall it kind of does it looks I mean it looks cool it does somewhat say Pinium, but then again, it could be like a 486. I think this case, though, is trying a little too hard to be modern, so it's not really saying 386 to me, so there's that. So this is, this is case number one that I could put the 486 in, but it currently has a Pinium in it, and I'd kind of, even though I think I'll, I'll put a different board in here because the... The board that's in here has a bad IDE channel, which tells me that, well, if an IDE channel's died, well, more could fail later. And if I use a compact flash card, I, I really need two channels because one's going to be the compact flash card and then the other for the optical drive. So I'll probably put a different board in here. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is candidate number one. I'm kind of leaning against it, but I, it wouldn't make a bad 486. All right. I'll let you all stare at this for a moment. Oh, and this is a quad speed CD-ROM, so obviously I will um I'll use something different if I for I'll put a different one in here for that. The quad speed I'll I'll probably I'll pair the quad speed with my 386DX system cuz that would be a totally fine for it. Yeah, Thomas is saying, I have a Pentium 233 and a real IBM 5170 case. Now, I have to admit, I have been tempted to actually put a Pentium in the AT clone case just because. But the only problem is it, uh, the power supply is only like a, um, to be able to use a, uh, one of the side switch power supplies. And I know Jeremy's probably going to chime in. Well, why don't you put an ATX supply in it? I like the the side clicky switch, and I don't really want to. I don't want to waste the perfectly good AT power supply because I got boards that could use it and it's totally fine. With it. But yeah, my my clone case's power supply is only like oh, it's a two hundred watt power supply. Oh, actually, you know that might work with a Pentium since I wouldn't be using an actual mechanical hard drive. That might actually work with a Pentium. That might actually work with a Pentium. So, yeah. Okay, let me go grab the other case. Because it, it might be saying 486664. Let me go grab it. All right. I have candidate case number two here. Actually, the more I look at it, the more it might actually be saying 386. So 
So I got this case off of Recurry, I believe. This is an AT desktop case. It's actually it's in decent shape. It's got uh I think the original floppy drive, because the floppy drive is actually yellowed quite like the rest of the case. It's got a quad speed CD ROM drive of some sort in it. It has the megahertz display. Got the power, reset, and turbo. And a key lock. Of course, I don't have the keys for it. And... Yeah, it's a nice desktop case. And. Oh, and I think it still has a screw in it. I was about to say. And uh, we'll uh, pop it open to see what's hiding inside of it. All right. It does not have a board in it, so. Unfortunately, I didn't get a, a free board surprise with the case. It is, uh, the camera is kind of lying. It is like slightly yellowed, but it's actually not. It's, it's actually not very yellowed. I think, um. If I can get the uh, plastic, if I can show the plastic and the paint, there is like a slight difference in shade, but really it's, um, it, it's hard to notice it. So. Oh, cool. It looks like the front of the case has a little place you can lift out if your motherboard has a keyboard port on the front that's actually pretty neat so you know that's kind of a early design cue so anyways so it looks like it's got a 200 watt power supply which is totally typical i think the thing i heard rattling around was the cables it looks like someone mangled the Someone really mangled one of the cables. It's probably the hard drive. Okay, it's the hard drive LED. I mean, I can fix it. All right, good night, Francois. But the uh, see the quad speed CD ROM. Oh, ah, it was a drive bracket rattling around. So this case does require rails. And luckily, the, the hard drive got removed, but they put the brackets that it was mounted on in the case. So I have an extra set of rails for a five and a quarter inch drive. So that's good. That's what was rattling around. I was trying to look at this. Okay, so this CD-ROM drive does use a proprietary interface. But it looks like it might be one that's got 40 pins. So I could probably just use a single drive IDE cable to hook it up. Jeremy's saying, thinking this one's the 486. Well, it does have the two digit speed display. So that would definitely work. Well, Well, you know, I guess there's uh, no time, no time like the present to maybe turn this into, turn this into a computer. Okay, I do see one problem, however, that will prevent this from working with the 486 board. So this case will not be the 486, or I'll have to get it. Unfortunately, 
the CPU is in the wrong spot. There is not enough clearance. So I cannot put this board in this case. So it cannot be home to this board. It could be home to the other 486 board that I have, but that poses a problem potentially because that is a two digit display. Although I guess I could just change it to say low and high. Uh, that's what we did back in the day when you put a faster board in than a had a two digit display. You made it say low and high instead of speeds. It does look like it's the kind that I can set to say low and high. So, well, I guess this uh, case will probably be. No, Jeremy, I cannot take a Dremel to this case. The, the thing that I would be removing. If I took a Dremel to the case to put the CPU in, would be one of the drive bays. So I would like to leave the drive bay intact because reasons. Besides, I've got not one, but two motherboards that are actually short enough that I can put them in this case. It doesn't matter where the CPU socket is. They'll both fit. In fact, actually looking at this case, I think it was designed for oh actually there's a that i see the other problem this actually i think i see why you're saying 486 because this actually this case given the uh where the standoff locations are back all the way up here and the fact that it has a keyboard port or the ability to put a keyboard port on the front this might actually be a very late 286 case Kind of early 386 case. Yeah, so I don't want to, um, because actually there are standoffs underneath the power supply. This could take a very, very wide board. So, all right. I'm not, okay. So this, this cannot be the home for this 486 board. Because where the CPU socket is, I don't want to, I don't want to Dremel the, the drive cage. Also, that drive cage, I think, is giving the case its rigidity. This is actually really, this is a really, for being what was probably a budget case, this isn't like bottom of the barrel budget case. I mean, it's got welded supports. Granted, I think most desktop cases had to have supports, but they're actually somewhat reasonably welded the they've rounded over the bars uh, one side of it's rounded over the other side it's like they filed it down pretty well so it's not sharp i mean this is like i don't think this was an expensive case but for like a lower end case this actually is not a bad case so i, I kind of like it yeah yeah some something like that Something like that, Mike. And the fact that it's got a quad speed proprietary interface CD ROM drive tells me that I bet this was like a really early multimedia PC at one point. Okay, so I won't be putting my 486 in this case. But maybe I'll put the 386 in this case. Because I think I even have a sound card. Yes, the sound card. Okay, so I have a, a sound card that was pulled out of a Packard Bell. And it has, I think it has the right interface to use the CD-ROM drive if it works. So maybe uh, it's proprietary. It's a, um, it is a... Corison brand drive, but the interface, it says uh, IO bus on it. 
Oh, wait a minute. No, I think it is IDE because it's got uh, master slave cable select jumpers. Oh, okay, maybe it is IDE. It's probably early IDE because it says IO bus and not uh, IDE or a tappy. Actually, yeah, this uh, this actually this would make a really nice case for my 386DX40 because it's a short board, so it's only going to come to about here which is good, so it should line up with standoffs. A four-speed CD-ROM drive would be more than enough for any cool CD-ROM games I might want to play on it. 200 watts is definitely enough of a power supply. I, I do like the um, Turtle logo on the power supply. It's kind of like, our, our, uh, the Tortoise, our power supply is slow. Yeah, yeah, proprietary drive wouldn't have the, the IDE jumpers. Mike says it'd be a nice Pinium case. Yeah, actually, it would be a nice Pinium case. This would be a nice Pinium desktop case. Yeah, 200 watts is overkill for a 386. Yeah, no. Switching power supply. Yeah, I, I saw that and thought that was just cute. Actually, you know, I was wanting to get to the Packard Bell, but there is. Now, now I'm curious. What do I have that I could put in this case? And I could use it as a either if we have time left over after the Packard Bell. Or a teaser for later. Let me see. I've got, I've got some pinion boards. I do have some pinion boards. Question of where I stuck them. Because I like putting things in safe, safe, quote, air quotes, safe spots. Okay, here's one of them. Can we, like, can I just give you one? Yeah, I can. Okay. So, would this board fit? Okay, so I'm not I'm, I'm just test fitting. So here's the Asus board uh I got from Oh yeah, hey Dave. So there's the Asus board I got from Jeremy. He was uh I got he was consigning it for someone. So actually this board would fit because the the only thing under the drive cage is the cache on the board. So, this could make a neat Pentium system. Now, of course, the only thing is I need to... I, I don't remember what processor's on it, but I need... Uh, ideally, I would put a, a 233 or a 200 in it. So... I have a 200. Okay, so this would be one candidate, and this board would support a, a 200 to 233 megahertz processor. It does have, this is an ATI Mach 64 uh, Asus Media Bus card, so it's got the Mach 64, and it does have the Vibra 16 sound. It's, it's the version of the Vibra 16 that has the built-in Sound Blaster emulation, so it doesn't sound that great, but... Uh, it does have the pads for more components, so I might be able to fix that in the future. So, this is one possibility. Although, quite honestly, I kind of thought of putting a slightly better card in a Pentium 233 build than a Mach 64. So, I don't know. This one might not be the board I pick. Uh, I do have some other boards. And by some other boards, I think that count as one other pinion board. 
just uh, I hooked on up this one of my Timium boards. Up. Oh. Now oh, there went a, a random TPM CIA card I grabbed out of the scrap pen that may or may not work anyways. So I hooked Ron up with my so if you remember I had a PC chips motherboard that I I got it and the seller said it's tested. I tested it and it wouldn't post. The seller sent me a full refund. So anyways, I I fixed it. It it turns out it needed the flash chip replaced and there was a bad cap on it and keyboard connector was broken. So Ron was looking to buy a, a Pentium board, so I hooked him up with that board and a, a Pentium 200 that I had. So I had two of them, so it was one of my spares. And uh, a nice uh, S3 Verge DX video card and 16, I think I found a 16 or 64 meg, my, the smallest SD RAM I found that would work in the board. So I, I hooked Ron up with that. So I'm sure Ron will probably show his DOS gaming system off at some point. So I do have this one though. This is a, a A open board. So it doesn't have the media bus, but it does also, it fits. There's not, no conflicts. I can still get to all the RAM. Socket seven. Now this board, I think I could actually go to, I'm trying to read the, so this one, I think I could actually run some of the K62 and K63 processors in. Because I think it has bus speeds and clock speeds high enough for some of those. Not all of them. But then again, though, with the 200, 200 watt power supply, I'm probably not going to go to the top end of socket 7. Although, again, I would have... I'm. Well, I mean, I could, I've, I've got some slightly beefier AT power supplies, so I mean, I could rectify that. I could always also replace, for something like this where I'm putting a Pentium in it, I could put a, replace it with an ATX power supply and an adapter to, to give it a little more power. So that, that would be a possibility. So this is the other board I could pick, or I could find a, a better Pentium board. Although I got to be careful that I don't overlap because I'm actually looking for a, like an NPX or LPX style case. Uh, potentially. Um, because I, I picked one of these up. So assuming I don't need this for plan C to fix the IBM that Jeremy gave me that had the um, issue in the ultrasonic cleaner, then I'll, uh, I'd kind of like to find a case to put this in because this is actually kind of a, uh, a neat board. So this would actually not be a bad board to pick for my like 233 megahertz. Potentially. Because it takes SD RAM. It's got a uh, onboard uh, Trio 64 V2DX. Although, I don't know. I may not. I may not put it in a system. It's a neat board, but if I don't need it to repair Jeremy's system, I may repair it and sell it. It has a few caps that need replaced. I think it works, though. But that one won't go in this case. So anyways, so there's two Pentium boards I could put in this case. Because this would make a really neat Pentium desktop. I do have some faster beige optical drives. I think I've got a... I've got a DVD-ROM drive I could put in here. And actually, the DVD-ROM drive might be a slightly better match for the faceplate because it's, like, lightly yellowed. So it might actually match the case better. I could put this quad speed in something else. Although, the one thing about this motherboard I don't like, the Zeus board I got from Jeremy has metal clips on the RAM. This one has plastic on the 72-pin SIMs, although it takes SD RAM, so that's uh, at least a, 
a mitigation point. So anyways, all right, I think I'm kind of warming up to putting a Pinium in this desktop and having like a, a Pinium 233 desktop. So that does leave me with Okay, so if I put a Pinium in this case, then I don't need a Pinium in that mini tower case that I picked up at the swap meet. And that Pinium tower at the swap meet is, uh, well, the motherboard's got a bad IDE channel on it. So I was probably going to replace it anyways. And given the fact that I broke the one case I was going to use, um, I mean, I've got the case. Unfortunately, I, I need to... I'm having trouble finding a button that will fit in place of the old turbo switch. So it's actually maybe a candidate case for something that doesn't turbo. But I also, the thing I broke covers the gaping holes and gives the identifying legends for all the lights and whatnot. Although, it would certainly be easier for me to fabricate a replacement if I didn't have to put a cutout for the megahertz display, so... Also possible maybe that would be the case I put a Pinium in and just forget about the whole megahertz display in it because I broke the case. And then I only need to make a replacement legend or a replacement thing to... Um, Cover up the megahertz display, go over the rest of it, and just give a legend for the LEDs. Or, quite honestly, I could just maybe find a solid label to put over it, and you just see the faint glow of the LEDs behind it. I don't know. I haven't figured out what to do with that case yet because of my, uh, well, I mean, I think I was probably doing almost the right thing. I should have maybe applied some heat to lift the thing off because I, I thought it was, I, I thought it was just taped on and not glued on, but I think it was still going to break because it was re like really fragile plastic. So I think even if I had used some heat to try to convince it to come off the case, I think I was going to break it. It, w it was just too fragile. Um, it's the, the case I'm talking about that I broke the, the uh, legend plastic piece on. It's the one that had that really super dirty power supply in it. So it's also possible that the, that case might have had environmental damage to it, which made that plastic piece fragile. So, okay, so I'm going to set this case aside. We'll have some fun with this case later. Uh, it might be another stream. I, I'm thinking I'm going to put a Pinium in it because that would be really cool to have a little Pinium desktop. So. I think that means that I'm going to I'm going to uh, take this uh, t mini tower that I got at the swap meet. So this mini tower had a had a, has the pinion board in it, and I think I'm going to put the 486 board in here. So. There we go. This 486 is finally going to get a case. And now I need to find the screwdriver that I knocked on the floor. Because I can't find my other screwdriver, but I think that's because it's actually upstairs on my desk upstairs. All right. So we'll take another look at what was in this computer as I pull these parts out. So now I'm not going to like, I won't scrap this motherboard, but it might, I mean, I can't say that I won't list it on eBay really cheap as Pinium board with a failed ID, uh, one failed IDE channel for someone that is going to use an expansion card. But this Pinium had a Cirrus Logic 5440 card in it. So that could make a neat card for the right system. In fact, actually, that'd probably be pretty... Uh, actually, uh, that's a card I think that Diamond was using on some of their Speedstar PCI cards. So unlike Trident that was made cards 
to the price point. Now, Serious Logic actually had some really nice chips, but ultimately they couldn't compete with the 3D, the 3D cards. All right, uh, we have a creative modem. So I think I'm going to, uh, little does Joe know, I'm probably just going to send this to him because we all know he needs more modems. After all, how, how can he perfect his modem sounds if he doesn't have more modems to refer to to make modem sounds? And I'm just waiting for Joe to enter the chat and be like, uh, no, I do not need any more modems. Thank you for keeping, uh, thank you for uh, thinking of me, though, or something like that. So, Joe, if you're out there a lot lurking and watching, uh, stay hydrated. And if the game doc's out there and lurking, uh, yes, I think I stole your line. Okay. So, oh, you know, I think I, um, I think I might have finally found the uh, memory modules I was looking for. I think these might actually be eight megabyte modules in here. <laughs> Mike says I've got an external USB 56k modem if he needs modem sounds, <laughs> and I and I have an internal 1200 BPS modem with a <laughs> big speaker on it. So I can record connecting to nothing, yeah. Uh, I, I think Joe can uh, accurately emulate the sound levels of your 1200 BPS modem. Okay, so we had, there were two memory modules on this motherboard. I don't remember what they are. They are MT RAM modules from the late 90s. So actually they're they're probably okay. I think. MT had sorted their production problems by then. All right, this board had a Pentium non-MMX Pentium 120. So I'll hold on to that. Yeah, Sadback has a couple PCMCIA modem cards that you haven't been able to do anything with. Yeah, I've got one somewhere that's missing the dongle. It's the problem with those PCMCIA modem cards. They're easy to find tucked away in laptops you find in uh, thrift shops and on eBay and whatnot because the, the card without the dongle just kind of lurks in the bay. But, well, also without the dongle, they're useless or, and worthless. So the sellers just don't bother pulling them out and selling them separately. All right. So. Have the Caviar 21, 20, 22100, the 2.1 gigabyte hard drive. This would actually be a really neat drive for one of the builds I'm trying to do if it worked. But sadly, as I figured out when I took a look at the system, this drive is dead. So... Because actually for the build I'm trying to do, I actually need, well, actually, I really need a Mac store, uh, seven, I think it's a 71624 drive to be accurate. But I mean, this would be close enough to start with if it worked, but it doesn't work. Although maybe with that out of the case, I might see if I could get it to work. Also has this label on it that says orange. I don't know what that's about. Probably the company that sold the board. All right. Well, and uh, that's just another useless hard drive to add to my collection of useless hard drives. And then we've got this motherboard. It is a EFA brand motherboard, and the primary IDE controller is bad on it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that if there's any, I don't see any damage on the board, but well, sometimes things like that just fail. 
I mean, it could be a bad solder joint on something. I'll look at the underside of the board. It's possible that if I see that maybe there's cracked solder joints on the IDE connector for the primary channel, uh, that I might fix this board up and sell it on eBay. Make a few bucks back for my swap meat expenditures. Or can, uh, or might hold on to it too, because I can use, I, I can hook people up with pinion boards at a really good price if it's ones I've fixed. No, I don't see any signs that the IDE connector is like. I suspect it's probably failed. I mean, the multi controller could could be not soldered to the board. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to repair this this stream. Oh, but actually, I think I just realized the IDE controller is probably, quite possibly, not on this chip. It's probably in the chipset. Oh, hey, Tom. Yeah, Justin damaged board Morgan. Yeah, I do have a tendency of buying damaged boards. Unfortunately, this board doesn't have the mini jumpers I need for the G3, so... Well, can't steal jumpers from it. All right, well, this might be a uh, board that comes back on... Uh, potentially on Dave's stream. I might take a look at it and see if it's... There's anything I can do to actually fix the primary IDE channel, see if there's maybe like a solder joint or something that's suspect. You know, I should probably really dust the, uh, dust things out, but I'm not going to. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Tom, your, uh, your, your joke just lost, uh, 10 points of funniness because you had to point out your spelling error. This is somehow blame Steve. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot to ask Steve during his last live stream if his speakers work. As I I'd picked Steve up a set of UMAC speakers at the thrift shop. I picked them up at the SPCA thrift shop here. They wanted a whopping $5 for them, which I knew. I, I just knew Steve was going to want them, so I went ahead and I, I picked them up for the five bucks. And yeah, Steve got uh, replied back probably as soon as he saw the word UMAX. He was like, yeah, I don't know that they came with the UMAX system, but I want them. It's like, well, five bucks. That's what I paid. They're, they're yours for what I paid for them. So uh, now I'm curious if they worked. I, I'm trying to find my container of standoff because, of course, this board is missing standoff. And of course, my container of standoff has disappeared because I need them. All right. It's there. Unfortunately, there, it's one of the things I somehow managed to knock on the floor so they're they're probably like on the floor which i have to give credit to whoever made the plastic container they came in because i have yet to manage to knock it on the floor and it busts open so yay for that but i think i need to paint the thing lime green but i still wouldn't be able to find it so what's the point Because this case has a few, too few standoffs for that 486 board. I will, though, leave the floppy drive in here for now. I'll leave the CD-ROM in here. Even though it's only a quad speed. But uh, I'll probably replace it at some point. Um... Let's see here.
I'm thinking I may have to actually, I've got two containers of uh, fasting. One of them I know is upstairs, and somehow I suspect the other one might be upstairs. Kind of messed up the timing. Sometimes it helps to uh, look at my desk in the reverse direction. Well, I'm going to take a, a quick two-minute break. I'll go run upstairs. I'll go grab the container of fasteners that I know is upstairs. Hey, Kibbs. Uh, yeah, I will be right back. I'm going to go go take a quick break. I'll go, go get a drink of water, go get the container screws. And I'll be back, and we'll put this 486 board in this case.
All right, I'm back. I found the uh, managed to find the eight megabyte memory module I was looking for before. I don't think it'll change what that 486 board thinks about about it, but I do know it's actually an eight megabyte module. I also thought I would uh, hint at upcoming shenanigans. By the way, I think this one is on brand. I won't say why. But yeah. So. Yes. Uh, although I will say there might be a reason I picked a clone board. Yes, I am back. So don't forget to uh, smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications so that YouTube tells you when I go live. And if you want to help me replenish my supplies and other fun goodies for the channel, I do have the coffee. Link is in the description below. And uh, as Tom Barber is telling everyone, I'm back, so stop talking about me. Hopefully it was good things. Okay, good. Uh, this case takes the same size standoffs as is in my StarTech kit. All right. So let me get the 486 board here. Let me go ahead and remove the expansion cards. And then I will line these up with standoffs. Unfortunately, this case is not one of the ones that lets you remove the tray. So. I just want to make sure that I don't have any clearance issues before I start to put standoffs. And actually, I think the issue I'm having is I'm just getting caught up with cables that are in the case. So. Yep, this board will actually fit. So, I think it'll fit. There we go. I was just caught up on a cable. All right. So it looks like the new bus is better than ISA. That was loopy. Okay, so it looks like the two standoffs that are already in the case line up with mounting points. Excellent. All right, so I need one in this far corner here and one in the far corner there. And uh, there is a location here about midpoint which actually lines up with a screw-in standoff. And then I think for the end of the board, I may have to put one of the standoffs on that just kind of holds the board off the bottom. Although, maybe not too worried about that. All right, let me see. So, for these two corners, I need to use these these style standoffs because they'll slip into the here and the matching one on the other side. So you put it in and slide forward. All right. Well, okay. This one standoff. Uh, it's not going to, the one in this corner here, because they kind of give you some adjustment ability. That one's not going to stay in that great. All right, so there is a standoff. Okay. There's one between the Visa local bus slots. I think that one lines up with a standoff, a uh, slot 
on the board. Yes, it does. So I put a nylon standoff there. So this one here, I need to put a screw standoff in because there is a, well, if the screw, if this fits. Possible. These standoffs that came with this case are the different threads, so I may not be able to screw this in, uh, which I think is the case. So instead, I will find a tool. And now I wish I had bought the five sixteenths. Thing of a doodle. All right. Okay. Well, let me see if I can. I think that is the wrong thread. All right, let me see if I see my socket set down here. Do I need to use a socket? Unfortunately, my socket set likes to run away. Oh, but I see it. It has not run away. Seven thirty seconds, not five sixteenths. There we go. All right. Let's see if I can get this started. Actually, I think it really is the wrong. Okay. That is the wrong thread pitch. Therefore, therefore, I'm just going to have to. Oh. Do what we also did back in the day. And that would be make my own standoff. Or actually, if I could find my other set of fasteners, I think it's got the correct, the correct part in it. Anyway, so I'm just going to take some snips and I'm going to cut the part off of this nylon standoff that would go into the slotted groove. And now basically I have a standoff that will just ride flush with the board. And I can now put this on the motherboard in that position. And now that will prevent the board from undesirable issues. I think I may also need to do that 
for the this corner here. But let me try to put this in and I'll see if it needs it. Because there shouldn't be any pressure on the board from that corner. Even when inserting cards. But may not be needed. Okay. Oh. And there just went my side cutters. Hopefully they did not land pointed side down and break. All right. So this one corner, I'm going to have to, there we go. That. So, ah, uh, yes, I am now remembering all of the annoyances with AT style cases and lining them up with the features in the case. There we go. One problem I have is that it feels like this board is, I'm turning it up once in, it feels like it's like up too high. Okay, but this one corner of the board that I can't put a standoff in because it doesn't line up with the case, I do need to, I do need to put something there. Let me grab my fasteners. Let me make another custom standoff. Here we go. Another standoff that doesn't have the plastic piece. So there we go. So now these two have some support under them. This one's lining up. This one's got a screw standoff. That one matches up with the screw. This one just stayed in the case. And that one goes in the corner. And by golly, I think this uh, board, I was wondering why the board seems to be doing the thing it's doing. And it would seem as if this board has a natural warp in it. So that's... Nice. I'm hoping screwing the board down doesn't like mess it up. Oh, I think. Ah, okay. Well, that's why it felt weird. Uh, the board has that a natural warp to it. All right. So let me put the screws back into these two standoffs. So there we go. Ah, uh, you know, it feels nice to have 46, one of the 46 motherboards finally in a case. Look at that. There we go. 486 is in a case. Now, the only drawback is it can't really replace the RAM. While it's in the case, because I don't think 
the oh okay no you can't uh, it doesn't tilt far forward the the metal piece of the case is in the way well all right so i will when i get the two eights two eight parodies i uh, will just have to remove this board from the case to install them oh well that was actually well that was a thing back then cases that had parts that were not very well aligned All right, we got power. I, I know this case is kind of dusty. I'll, I'm going to pull this board out again at some point, so I'll dust it then. I just want to put this in the case so I can power it up in situ. All right, so I got the heat sink plugged in. I'll do cable management later. Main thing is there's nothing blocking the heat sink there and it is plugged in. All right, due to having the compact flash card sticking out the side, this one will have to go here because otherwise I block all three Visa local bus slots. Okay. I, I wish this board had a kind of wish it had another corner or like a, a support location here. I may uh, I may find a, something I can put under there. I know back in the day some cases would have like a rubber rubber bumper or something just stuck to the case to keep the board from flexing and I'll probably do that just under this kind of right between the Visa local bus slots on the back just to keep the board from flexing too much when you plug a VLB card in. Okay so this IDE card I was just kind of keeping in this last slot here. I may have to move it if I use the optical drive. Uh, you can't see that. Okay, the mock card I was putting in, well, I was putting it in the slot marked VL1 because it's my best VL card, Visa Local Bus card, so it goes in slot VL1. I don't know if that's the actual logic you use to decide what slot Visa Local Bus cards go in, but that's my logic for this build. My best Visa Local Bus slot card goes in VL1. And. There we go. So I got the, the Mach 64, I got the controller card, I got the IDE, I got power to the main board. I have, well, I do actually have an actual floppy drive in this case. So I will go ahead and jumper that, or I'll go ahead and cable that to the controller card. I don't, have a fl I don't well actually I could probably find a flappy disk and format it and and DOS. I suspect this floppy drive is going to need clean though, just given how dusty the case is. I'll probably have to clean it, but alright. Well at least see if it seeks. And it has power. The IDE drive in the top, I don't well actually oh here we go. There was an IDE cable in this case, but is it long enough to go from the very top to the very bottom? Always important questions. Now, it's probably what I'll do is I'll go get one of those like compact flashcard slot bracket adapters. Just not that they're period accurate, but honestly, 
they just they make it easier for testing software. So that's my excuse there. I mean, I can always remove it. By oh, the way, this case has that discolored face plate. Okay, I may actually may print out a, maybe I'll print out a five and a quarter inch drive bay adapter for one of those, so I can at least have something on the face plate that looks like a closer match. That might be what I do. Again, I can always put that slot back. I think someone probably replaced it at one point, but you never know. Maybe, maybe it really did. Uh, one of them really did yellow at a different rate than the others. Okay. Yeah, I'm about to plug this in now that I've got everything. Okay, I don't have front panel connectors wired up, but I've got enough to at least see that I got a viable system in this tower. So there we go. I will leave it on table cam enough for the smoke test. So, three, two, one. And I got the floppy drive in backwards. Okay, well, that's pins one and two. Oh, uh, is this one of those? Ah, this is one of the floppy drives I hate because it looks like it has a knot on both the top and the bottom. It's like they designed it to uh, the floppy drive to work with cables that are made to spec and cables that were made not to spec. Yeah, there we go. I always I always plug the cable in wrong the first time on those because you, you can't use where the notch is on it. There we go. All right, now the floppy drive's not plugged in backwards. I mean, I'm not expecting anything different because all I did was put it in a case, but. All right, floppy drive seat. All right, let me. All right, while we wait for that, let me see if I can't grab my, I'm grabbing my floppy drive cleaning kit. I'm looking to see if I can see my, there we go. I'm gonna clean the drive heads and then I'll see if I got a floppy disk floating around. There we go. And OneDrive wants me to sign in. All right, let's see here. Dir A colon. Retry. This is a cleaning disk. The instructions say to let it run for 15 seconds, so we'll go ahead and do a couple retries. All right, the eject mechanism of that drive is gummed up, so I will have to lubricate this drive at some point, probably. All right, as for floppy disks, I have a green one floating around here somewhere, assuming I didn't realize. Oh, here we go. I've got a whole box of disks over here, but I could use some more. All right, let's see if it formats. Um, I think the drive needs lubricated. Or maybe there is something wrong with track zero on this disc. Let me try it one more time. All right, drop. I 
it is quite possible that this is bad. Oh, that disc might actually be bad. There we go. Hey, it's formatting. Let me catch up with uh, the chat that is obstructed right now. Let's see here. So, I do hope Prada is okay, but Prada seems to have survived like a lot, so I'm sure Prada is okay. Mike says, Prada just fell off the top of my sunblade onto the workbench, then onto the floor. So what does that floof do? Jumps right back on top of the sun. Of course. Cats like anything that's warm and suns are warm. <laughs> huh. Floofy is cleaning and taking images of stuff found in his closet. Excellent. Kib says cats are confusing. Yep. Our cat, uh, Kib says, our cat is trying to kill us by always trying to jump out of the windows. <laughs> Mike points out the Prada's jumped out of his second floor apartment windows twice. <laughs> oh, hey, Nick. Uh, Retro Techie, it uh, does appear that it is a computer. The only thing I've got to do now is decide which sound card to put in it. Also, uh, if someone has an AOL CD, oh wait, that's mic tech. I don't want to duplicate mic tech. If someone has a CompuServe CD and would like to send it to me for testing CD-ROM drives, then uh, yeah, that'd be great. Did CompuServe ever make CDs? CompuServe floppy disk would be great too. Yes. Let's see here. Ba ba ba. Uh, <laughs> see. Uh, Mike, your boss jumped out of the window again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, Mike points out Sassifras is his boss. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, Jesse. Uh, dogs have masters. Cats have staff. Yep. <laughs> Dave says, uh, Frederica, his cat was on his phone, iPhone. I think she was trying to dial up Prada. Yeah. <laughs> Is this stream brought to us by Retro Techies asking who the stream is brought to us by? This stream is brought to you by my awesome channel supporters. Link is in the description. Kib says this stream is proudly sponsored by PC Chips, the world's lowest standards PC motherboard maker. <laughs> Jesse uh, says PC Chips, we gave all of the budget to marketing. Yeah, including the budget that would have paid for actual cash chips. Sloopy says, the sun is hot. It needs a dimmer. <laughs> uh, Mike says, uh, Sound Blaster 16 ISA, of course. Yep. Retro Techie, what's a CompuServe? Yeah, Sloopy says, I heard AOL may have made a CD. Yeah. Uh, Retro Techie CompuServe was an online, well, online and not, not the sense of internet, but online in the sense of uh, you dialed in with a modem that was run by like Sears and some other companies and it didn't do as well as AOL. But says anything, AOL is still around somehow, CompuServe isn't. I think eWorld might have outlived CompuServe, but I'm not sure about that. And knowing that RetroTechie is now going to 
ask what's an eWorld. Well, that was Apple's online service in the sense that you dialed in with a modem. Actually, I I don't have any Sound Blaster cards for this computer because Sound Blasters are just too hard to find these days. It's <laughs> retro techie. What's a Sears? Oh, come on. I'm sure they had Sears in Canada. Although, actually, I'm not sure they had Sears in Canada. All right, I think I got the, I, I got a sound card in mind for this computer. I got the sound card. All right. Uh, Retro Techie, given what I've heard about Canadi Canada Tire, or Canadian Tire, uh, no, I don't think Sears was like Canadian Tire. Because Sears never sold groceries. Although Sears did have a, uh, in some locations, had a uh, auto and tire department, so... Maybe they are like Canada, Canadian t Tire, whatever. The Canada Tire, Canadian Tire, um, whatever. So I have this uh, ESS audio drive, ES1869F sound card that I picked up somewhere. It does not have IDE, but I already have uh, two IDE channels in controller cards on this. The ESS actually has a pretty nice... OPL3 emulation, so it'll actually sound fairly decent. And yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to use this ESS audio drive in this computer, which means I'll have to um I'll have to find drivers for it. So. Oh, yeah, Sears had, uh, yeah, Craftsman Tools, and, uh, yeah, Sears used to sell everything, including, yeah, Sloopy's pointing out, including houses, cars, and other things. Yeah, they, they like, they had, like, a catalog that was, like, the Sears catalog used to be a big deal. Now it's just, like, a source of paper for recycling yeah i remember the day you, you're like uh, you're like parents or grandparents would get the sears catalog this big enormous book of lots of paper that they'd mail to your house several times a year if you were a good customer and it had like had all the clothes in the front and the toys were in the back and of course as the kid you'd always flip to the back and you'd start calling out like toys on every other page that you wanted. And if you were lucky, one of them might show up. If you were really lucky, your parents or grandparents would actually find something better than the toys that were in the Sears catalog, which was actually amazing that there was actually better things than what was in the catalog. But I do remember, though, that they did also have computers in their catalog. I mean, yeah, they had everything at one point. <laughs> Jeremy says, yeah, uh, Nick uh, points out, yes. Let's see, let me, uh, yeah, yeah, Sears sold TVs too, Jesse. Yep, that's for sure. Uh, Retrotech is pointing out Hudson's Bay Company. Yeah, that might be closer to what Sears was like. Uh, Retrotech is asking, did Sears sell Apple II computers? I don't think they did. I think they sold laser computers, though. So with the Apple II clones. 
Um, let's see. Eric's visited one of the kit houses. Yeah, very neat. Oh, maybe they did sell Apple II computers at one point. I would, um, yeah, they, um, they sold a lot. Yep, uh, Nick's pointing out Sears was the Amazon of the 1920s. Yes, they definitely were. Uh, Jeremy says the Sears catalog got so big that it could have been used for home defense. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Sloopy, uh, the Sears catalog was three to four inches thick. Yeah, uh, that's one moose hoof in Canadian measuring. <laughs> Good one, Sloopy. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dave says there was a house here in Sutter Creek that was bought as a kit from Sears. Yep. Yep, uh, Mike says Sears sold the Laser 28, so close enough. Yep. Did Sears sell puppies? No. However, I do believe uh, on some of their catalog pages, they there were puppies on the catalog page, probably to entice people to buy things. I do remember occasionally seeing animals, or uh, it was probably usually in the lifestyle, because uh, some of the pages had like life, I guess, lifestyle photos of, like, people using the products, and sometimes there was, like, a, a dog or a cat in the picture. But no, I, I don't think they... Uh, no, they never sold puppies or kittens or animals. All right. So I put the sound card in and then I realized I don't have the right speakers hooked up. And I don't have a driver disc for this sound card handy. So I think given that it's like 1043 and I kind of wanted to. kind of wanted to start to take a look at the Packard Bell. But then again. I'm having so much success with this computer. Mm. Let me see. All right. Let me see if I can quickly find a uh, driver disk. Or the sound card. If, uh, if someone has a link handy, although I, I think I should be able to find them fairly easily. Yes, 1869 drivers. Oh, there we go. Dos Days, very good website. They have plenty of good stuff. I figured they would probably be the site that would come up when I searched for drivers. There we go. Yes. Let's see, it should be 18. Doesn't seem right. Okay, this is a Windows ESS DOS config. Actually, that one. I think there's what I need right there. Should be the DOS config tool. So let me double check. Let me look at the readme file here real quick. What in the world did that just open with some weird... Oh, okay. Okay, I think this is the utility I need. Yep, because this it doesn't require uh, 
sus. Okay, it would require Windows 3.1 drivers. But what I found is the, the DOS configuration utility. So it'll at least set the card up for working in DOS. So let me pull the compact flash card out. Let's stick it into my PC here real quick. And let me copy these files onto it. And then we'll set up the card. Let's see here. Let me new folder. This we'll call this ESS. And then I'll copy. I'll have to find the Windows 3.1 drivers later, but I was just going to see if it ran in DOS. Also, let me see here. PC. Oh, I just realized this compact flash card. One gigabyte compact flash card is. Apparently one of the computers, whatever computer I formatted it in, had the 500 megabyte limit on it. So I could pull this promise card out and I would be fine. Okay. So I got the ESS configuration utility on the drive. All right, we'll take a moment for shameless self-promotion while we wait for the thing to boot. We got a YouTube channel, and if you're one of the mods, then uh, you can share your channel. And, well, if uh, you see a, a mo uh, someone that's not a mod that has a YouTube channel, you can plug their channel too. So, yeah, shameless self-promotion. While I uh, do the, the boring thing of... Disabling the PicoGus software. Let's see here. I'm not going to delete it. Just going to comment it out. Yep, you can go check out Jeremy's GoFundMe to help him go to VCF Midwest. Ah, Sloopy has shame, so he can't promote. <laughs> go subscribe to Retro Techie's channel, or, or he'll ask you to subscribe. Again, some other day. All right. I think if uh, ESS CFG is the utility to configure the card. So let's see here. 225.1.300. Oh. And oh, it looks like it's uh, configured. Already configured. Awesome. Okay. Let's see here. Probably need to go grab a set of speakers. Let's see if set up. Set up. Like sound card. All right, I don't remember if the ESS 1869, if 
it does Sound Blaster or Sound Blaster Pro. Let me check real quick. What go grab a See, plug and play. Oh, okay. Well, I did find the uh, Windows 3.1 drivers for it, so that's good. Unfortunately, I can't. I am having trouble quickly seeing if it's Sound Blaster or Sound Blaster Pro. So I'm going to try Sound Blaster Pro. Okay, let me go grab a pair of speakers. Oh, hey, Gut Bomb. Welcome. All right. Speakers, speakers. Where are the speakers that can actually plug into the system? They are... Hiding. Everything hides. I mean, I could plug... Uh, I don't have a cable to plug the Bose speaker into this. Uh, that cable's probably upstairs. Because it's white to plug Bose speakers off. Of it. I don't necessarily bring everything downstairs because I don't realize sometimes how far I'll be on my screen. Although my gateway speakers are down. Oh, I know where they are. Here they are. Oops, I'm caught up on something though. There we go. All right. Gateway speakers. Oops. Plug the all right. We see where the. Oh, there we go. All right. I think that's the speaker output. We'll know momentarily. If it's the speaker output, I'll have sound. If it's the. Uh, Microphone, then I just made the world's uh, most interesting way. All right.
Just one bit when you need him. All right. Of course, this is the awkward gameplay because I'm having trouble seeing the uh, screen. All right, that sounds good. Although I have to admit the, um, I think it does sound slightly better with the Pico Gus, but yeah, that, uh, that sounds good. Let me see here. What other games do I have? You know, th there's a trend. These are the games I tried with the Pico Gus. Let me see here. Uh, we'll try. Actually, I think this game really needs a... I was actually talking with one of my coworkers about this game this morning. Let me see here. I think I need a... Oh, Chex Quest works with the Gravis Ultrasound. Interesting. Sound Blaster 220. Effects Guard. Sound Blaster 220. 5-1. We'll keep the default. Controller, keyboard. Save parameters. Okay, not necessarily award-winning music, but... What do you expect for a pack-in game? As in, a pack-in game that came with cereal. have Super Mario Sunshine on this retro techie. Of course, I also don't have much armor and I can't see things, but anyways.
Yes. All right. It's the 486. It, um, it works. And it's in a case. I'll have to change. I'll have to update my thumbnail now. Oh, well, no longer the sleeper 486. So, hey, there we go. Excellent. Got sound. It's got video. I'll deal with drivers later. I, I probably picked that sound card up on... No, actually, I don't think I did pick that up on eBay because I'd probably have regretted it. I think I, I think I snagged that on Mercari. Yeah, that's why I can't remember where I got I think I snagged it on Mercari, yeah. Uh... A retro techie, uh, this is a PC, not a Nintendo. And it's not fast enough to emulate it. Yeah, it, it lives. Uh, the case needs dusted. I'll have to fill in the uh, missing case bracket slots. But hey, at least now I've got a 486 and it's in a case. And I don't have to, if I want to use it, well, it's in a case. So, hey, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't have a CD handy to test the CD-ROM drive, but there we go. It's the, the 486. Oh, hey, Chris. So, there we go. So, just a quick recap. We got the, uh, the it's the... The AMD, AMD Fanboy 486 board, it got the nickname because for a while it only liked AMD processors. But I've got an IBM Blue Lightning 486DX266. And I uh, got right back cache enabled. I got 16 megs of RAM, 256k of cache. And I, I can't, uh, I couldn't get it to work with 24, but I'll, I'll try it again when I'm. I'm gonna get two eights to to live in here. I'll I'll post something to socials if I get 24 to work. But I'm I'm gonna leave this with a 16 megs. That's a good amount. I've got an ATI Mach 64 video card, a Visa Local Bus. I've got this generic IDE controller card that actually has a Promise IDE controller. So that's why I've got this card down here. That's my secondary IDE channel plugged into the quad speed CD-ROM that was in the case. I don't know if it works. And then I got my ESS audio drive 1869 sound card, which does a decent sound blaster emulation because it their emulation of the OPL two or three chip, whichever one it emulates, is actually quite good. It's not an exact emulation, but it's actually actually in some of the games I've heard played online with the ESS 18, 1869. I actually like it better than this, the OPL two or three. It it has like a, um, I don't know, kind of maybe a slightly warmer tone, depending on the context. But anyways, yeah, awesome. All right, I guess it's now time to. Uh, Pull out the Packard Bell. Let me put my 486 to the side. I do have the lid for that case. It's just uh, not in a uh, easy to get to. Well, actually, I think I've got something sitting on top of it. All right, let me move these speakers here. Get them out of the way. So the interesting thing is, it seems like I have, I'm going to have like three computers that are so close together in speed, but that's okay. It's totally okay. So I've got... The IBM that Jeremy gave me, it's actually a Pentium 100. Well, once I get it up and running again. 
that that will uh It was, it was kind of one of the things I'd thought of that if uh, things were going really quick, I might take a look at. But I really want to look at the Packard Bell. So I'll have another PC stream where I probably try to fix it. Um, to fix it. Uh, Jeremy's saying, just for fun, which that scares me sometimes when Jeremy says just for fun, look for an ISA sound card with an ALS120 chipset on it. Is that one of those really awful chipsets, Jeremy? Because I probably already have a really awful chipset card, and I don't really need another. I, I'm, I'm not trying to collect all the sound cards. Uh, I, I don't recognize which one that is, Jeremy, honestly. There, there were so many sound cards, and some of them were, like, truly awful. Some of them were good. Uh, I don't... Uh, I don't necessarily need to start also collecting really awful sound cards. I think collecting really awful video cards, i.e. the Trident ones, are is probably enough for one streamer. Uh, oh, Retro Techie. Well, Retro Techie, you think maybe you can send some of those uh, um, non-duplicative 600 subscribers, or almost 600 subscribers, my way! Oh, ALS 120 is Sound Blaster Pro compatible. Okay. Well, I mean, I might check it out, but um, if it's like a decent compatible one, I don't necessarily need to try all the lousy comp compatible ones. There's enough YouTubers that like try all the sound cards. I mean, someday I might have them. I'm not going to go specifically look for all of them. There's just so many. But anyways, uh, so I've got I've got three computers that are going to be about the same. They're, they're going to be really close in speed, and this is not counting laptops that I have that, or might have, or might be wanting to get that might also be close in speed. But ew, what are these? So I've got the IBM Pentium 100 that Jeremy gave me. I've got this Packard Bell here, that is a Pentium 75. Then I have a computer that is not ready to reveal yet. And its clock speed is, well, all I'm going to say is you you can infer from those two clock speeds and my comment that I'm going to have three computers that are really close together. You can go ahead and infer uh, a speed and... You'll probably be correct, but I'm not going to confirm or deny. So, yeah, there's that. Um, well, tell you what, uh, Retro Techie, you can... I don't... Uh, okay, I don't know what you're trying to get. Oh, it's $6. Okay, now now I'm scared again, Jeremy. Uh, plus eleven dollars shipping. Uh, uh, okay. Well, okay, um, Retro Techie, you can have an ALS one twenty sound card, but uh, yeah, I'll give you free shipping. But the handling charge is going to really cost you. Um, I'll, uh, you can have one of those sound cards, the um, free shipping, but the handling charge is going to be 50 bucks US. Or I'll give you free handling, but you'll pay $50 US shipping. Your choice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know what... Can't lose with a six dollar sound card except the um eleven dollars in shipping if it's defective. All right. So uh got the Packard Bell here. I don't know how much memory's in it. 
I don't know how much... Actually, I don't really know how much anything's in it. The only thing I know is it's supposed to be a Pentium 75, according to the spec. That's all I know. And I think it's got a replacement hard, hard drive. I wouldn't be too sure about that retro techie. <laughs> All right, so. Oh. And it just powered up because of course it did. Well, uh, the good news is it appears to work, and the flappy drive spun up, and... The hard drive spun up, it powered up, I didn't ask it to. And it didn't give me a chance to plug the keyboard in. Okay. Where's the power switch on these things? Let's reset. Isn't there like a um, power switch on these, usually? I think I know now, now know why there's a uh, sticker hastily stuck to the front panel of this computer. I think it's over top of the power switch. All right. All right. Let me take the plastic faceplate off this tower so I can see if I can see where the power switch is. Because I see the cable inside the case. There it is. Uh, okay. I'm sticking my hand in here because I unplugged it. So I, I feel... There we go. Uh, yes. So if you saw the thumbnail, and I, that was an actual picture of this Packard Bell case. Let me go back to table cam. There's this uh, case badge slapped onto the front of it. And, of course, I was kind of like, well, I got a good deal on this system, so. I mean, after all, I paid. So, the tower case that I just took the parts out of was. Well, I paid $10 for it so that I could get the Packard Bell for 5 and the uh, G3 desktop for 5 it had this case badge on it. I think the power switch is actually underneath that. But I don't know why someone would have just slapped that on. Because then you can't turn it on and off. Unless, of course, the power switch is broken. And... I don't know. Oh. Oh yeah. Um so I just pulled the IP or the PC warehouse badge off of this case, which if anyone's wondering, I think it still has the peel on it. So well, I'll hold on to that badge for uh, another build perhaps that needs a badge I'll have to put new adhesive on it but yeah it would appear as if someone boogered up the case it looks like someone filled where the power switch goes with glue oh 
Okay, I have no idea what someone did. I guess, long story short, this power supply is, I guess, rigged to turn on as soon as you plug power into it. I suspect the power switch is broken. Lovely. All right, well. I guess, well, I can probably fix it. Well, okay, I don't know what I'll be able to do about the fact that they filled the hole with glue. Because that means the original plastic piece is long gone. I mean, it's quite possible I can find a 3D print model or something. I can replace it. I'll probably have to replace the power. Well. I don't know. Oh, I've got 24 megabytes of RAM in this computer. All right, function one for setup. So it is August 3rd, 2. Okay, it lets me type 1999. Oh, look at that. This BIOS is not year 2000 compliant. Well, okay, well, what happens if I, December 31st, 1999, at uh, 20, 23, 59, I don't know, 50. What does this do when it rolls over? <laughs> great okay this uh machine is trapped in the year uh 1999 well needless to say this is not year 2000 compliant also whoever set this up with memory mixed fast page and edo wonderful Oh, and you couldn't see any of that because I forgot to change views. Sorry, computer's in the... Uh... Computer was in the way. Anyways, I went into the BIOS. I tried to set the time, and uh, it, it wouldn't let me enter the year 2000. So I tried to enter December 31st, 1999, 50 and let it... Uh, count and oh boy are there gel bars in this video signal and the interesting thing is this is a serious logic of course it's a packard bell so probably a cheap implementation but yeah it, it rolled over from 23.59.59 to oh, oh 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 and it didn't increment the date All right, this may have personal data on it because it does appear as if someone forgot to wipe this. So I do like their choice of background. All right, Sarah, you should have wiped your data. Okay, at least so far, I have my finger on the uh, to switch scenes if I see any personal data on here. Well, interestingly enough, the uh, hard drive has an interesting volume. Uh, <laughs> Retro Techie. Windows 95? I thought we just got Windows 11. That's 84 Windows newer. The wallpaper's a migraine. Well, yes, the Walgreens, a, the wallpaper's a migraine, but also the wallpaper is retro, and it's a migraine. I'll, I should have plugged in a mouse. I'll have to change it. So, oh, wait. Do we have After Dark on here? Mm. 
Well, doesn't look like a uh, complete installation. America On Life 5.0a disk image. Wait, is this the... Wait a minute, is this the Packard Bell recovery? Yes! Okay, uh, it looks like I... Uh, and it looks like I opened a program that I cannot exit because I don't have a mouse, so... Let me, let me power down so that I can plug in a mouse real quick. It's now safe to shut off your computer. Yes, I'm going to plug in a mouse so that I can more easily navigate Windows 95 as well as change that wallpaper because it's really starting to get as immediate reaction oh cool look it's retro uh after 30 seconds of staring at it ew get it away quick yeah it looks like i can create restore media uh, assuming that the restore wherever the restore media is is still on the computer because that only looks like the program that creates it. Now, of course, I don't know how many disks I'm going to need. And I'm probably, I'll probably hook up a GoTech to create the restore media, assuming someone hasn't archived it. But he must be. Uh... I'll have to replace the uh, cluck module on this. Because I'm pretty sure it's got one of those Dallas modules. I'm actually pretty, uh, it's pretty nice that the hard drive works. I'm trying to look to see if I see the Dallas module that I thought was on here. I mean, it, there could be a coin cell battery on it, too. It, it's kind of a mix with Pentium systems. All right. So... I uh, don't know who the Sarah is that owned this computer, but um, retro security advice, the Windows 95 password thing, dealio means really nothing. All right. Let's change this wallpaper. Properties. Oh. Win logo, waves, triangles. Is there like a Packard Bell logo? There we go. Okay, it's kind of boring, but at the same time, it's what the system would have shipped with. So we got the Packard Bell logo. So it looks like we've got the disk image program. I do not know where the actual images are. I do know that whoever owned this computer sure made a lot of backup copies of various things here. Dallas. Okay, exchange. Ooh. They're exchange mailboxes. Don't know what that is. Not going to run it. Yeah, office documents. Okay. Not even going to open that folder. Packard Bell Tools. There we go. Back up. Oh, there we go. It's uh that's a backup of looks probably pre installed software, including a prodigy demo. There's an online service I haven't heard in a while. VGA utility. 
wind temp. Is this the Windows install? Maybe. I don't know what that is. Winds wind spec. Oh, here we go. Well, um Well that's good. I think this might mean the system might still have its tattoo on it. I'll have to look and see if I've got the link that RetroTech just sent me. Dear Packard Bell valued customer, congratulations on the purchase of your new Packard Bell computer. We are sure it will meet your computing needs and hope that you will continue to look to Packard Bell for future products. The following information will be valuable should you ever need service. Actually, I do need service, Packard Bell. My power button's broken. Computer model F442 CDT. Yep, this is a Force 442 CDT. Manufacturer's number 8421391107. I guess that's correct. Serial number. I have no idea if that's correct. Hard drive format number. I think this is what is needed to restore it. I think a RetroTech Chris would know for sure. The following items have been installed on or in your computer. There are no settings or adjustments required. Everything has been preset at the factory. Main board. Ah! Okay, so it looks like this shift with the Pentium 75, so no one's upgraded that. It would have shipped with 8 megabytes of memory. That, I think, makes sense. Jeremy says Packard Bell flew north to Canada. Okay, so someone's added 16 megabytes of memory. I don't blame them. Cirrus video controller, 1 megabyte of memory. No one's ever upgraded that. All right, now it looks like I queried the BIOS for the hard drive information because I don't think 850 megabytes was original. Installed peripherals. 14.4 modem, fax, sound. Yep, okay. And, ah, uh, there we go. Final test results exceeds all test parameters. It exceeds all test parameters. Well, it's not exceeding them now. Test date, April 14th, 1995, 9.04 a.m. Okay, what day of the week was that? Okay, now I'm curious. What day of the week was my computer born on, this computer born on? All right, so April... I can find the keyboard. Okay, what did I do with my keyboard? Oh, there it is. What day of week was April 14th, 1995? So my computer was born on a Friday. And what use is that? Absolutely none, probably. It was born on a Friday. Friday, April 14th, 1995. Where would I have been? I would have been at school when this computer was born. How did it exceed? I don't know. It's sloopy. Customer service. Power button is broke. Bring it in and we'll, we'll, we'll replace your computer. Yeah. So, apparently, this computer was born on a, a Friday, April 14th, 1995. I would have been at school. I'm going to decline to say what grade it would have been. I would have been a younger whippersnapper. And, oh, <laughs> well, I, I don't share the birthday with this system, but, yeah, Jeremy's saying he was in high school. I... Not going to say what grade I was in. But yeah, I would have been at school, 9.04 a.m. 
April 14th, 1995. I have no idea if anything famous happened that day. I mean, I know I like if you read my blog, I uh, reminisce about some event or an event that happened the day I registered the domain name. Um, let's just say that our the president of the United States at the time when I registered my first domain name wasn't exactly having the greatest of days. Uh, this would have been back in the like late 90s, so. I gotta have you all read my blog uh, somehow. Let's see, April 14th, 1995. In history, let's see if anything famous happened on this day. I don't, I don't remember anything particularly. I don't think anything special happened at school that day. For But then again, though, for all I know, they served, like, something really cool. All right, so according to this potentially suspect website, on April 14th, 1995, India beats Sri Lanka to win the Asia Cricket Cup final in... Sharjah. I have no idea how to pronounce that. I hope I got it close. Let's see. Famous birthdays. Baker May Baker Mayfield, American football quarterback. Was born in Austin, Texas. Uh, it looks like he won the Heisman Trophy in 2017 for the universe at the University of Oklahoma and was the 2018 NFL draft number one pick for the Cleveland Browns. Okay. Uh, looks like, uh, let's see, Brian Coffey, an Irish poet, died. Bur Burl Ives, American folk singer, died. James Daniel Danny Turner, a jazz saxophonist, died. Michael Scott Montague Fordham, an English child psychiatrist, died. Uh, nothing really exciting. Uh, apparently, the number one song uh, in the U.S. was This Is How We Do It by Mon Montel Jordan. And in the U.K., it was Back For Good by Take That. Okay, I guess this website needs to add. Justin D. Morgan's Packard Bell went through final test. Okay, sorry, nothing really exciting happened that day. Ah! And Jesse says, now Baker's on his fourth team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jack 68K was a uh, sophomore in high school. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, uh, um, I was in eighth grade. Jeremy says, coincidentally, in February 95, it was cold. Then there were three days of near 100 weather near Valentine's Day I went back to cold weather after that that bomb says I am sure I played some games on the Genesis that day yeah I uh, I don't know maybe I I used one of the LCs in the computer lab that day all right that's pretty cool system information I'm hoping that means that if I run the utility to read the tattoo off the drive that I will have a copy of that data All right, nothing really spectacular on the hard drive. It's good that it works, though. Um, Okay, that was weird. I don't know if that was the just the hard drive going to sleep like normal, or... Interesting, the video output of the Cirrus Logic video card in this computer is not that great. Okay, I know Mike Tech likes to scan disk his hard drive, so let's see. Oh, uh, I can't uh, see OBS. 
Oh, there we go. Let's see if this hard drive's good. It's making some nut noises I don't like. I'm hoping it's good, though. I don't know if I'll leave it in this computer. Because if this computer supports larger drives, I'll probably just put a compact flash card in it for longevity. Because this isn't the original hard drive that was in this computer. Ah, uh, 16K of lost data. All right, well, we'll go ahead and delete that and we'll skip the undo. Ah, let's do a surface scan. I know, I, the one thing I forgot to do though was find my sacrificial hard drives and plug them in and run the run it for five minutes, but I don't have any sacrificial hard drives. The hard drive I do use for testing is actually a working hard drive because it, it's just, it's a quantum hard drive from a Mac. Uh, so it'd be not a huge loss if it would die because it's only like a 40 megabyte hard drive. But... Yeah, Mike, Te Mike Tech's videos are very well edited, yes. He makes a uh, scan disk seem so fast. And yet, I'm going to make you sit through the entire thing here. I am going to move the mic closer to the hard drive in case it starts making kerklunking noises. How do you know? I haven't tried to eject the CD-ROM drive yet. I'll let scan disk run first, and then I'll um, I'll go, I'll go back to table cam and eject the CD-ROM drive to see if there's any disks in it. Maybe it's got the recovery CD in the, the CD-ROM drive. Wouldn't that be neat? I am still somewhat annoyed by the fact the power button is like filled in with glue on this computer, but then again, for what I paid for it, I think I can probably fix the problem. Uh, I'll probably, I don't know if anyone knows if there's any 3D printable like Packard Bell power button models out there. I can probably use some of that MAC Platinum plastic and it would probably look decent. In fact, I could probably find some light gray plastic and get away with it. Kind of a two-tone deal. I'm kind of wondering if it got filled in. I'm wondering if the plastic button broke. Because I suspect the switch probably works, but I don't know. I just kind of had been wanting a Packard Bell, sort of like the one we had back in the day, however briefly. So that's one of the reasons why I'm totally fine with having a Packard Bell that is so close in speed to two other computers I'm going to have. Because the Packard Bell has some sentimental value as the... As, as a Packard Bell... I don't know if it was a Force 442 CDT or another model, but we had one very much like this for except the one we had had the like quad speed cd rom drive that was like pervacious but other than that what is my mac platinum plastic of choice uh the, the the cheap stuff you get from amazon whatever the um the polymaker muted white it's close enough Color fab is color fab's too expensive for me. Y'all should know that I, I I go cheap and pay for it later. So, yeah, the the polymaker muted white isn't as close as the color fab. Nah, but it's close enough for me. Uh, 
got poly. Oh, okay. Gut Bomb has Polyterra, and it's so brutal. Yeah, I've read reviews of the Polyterra, and yeah, it's kind of one that I haven't, I not wanted to try. Yeah, I I think people like the Polymaker. On if I can find one of those uh, Packard Bell Power buttons, I may uh, I may see if I can get. Um, someone to print me one and actually you know I got one of those color match devices I might be able to find a plastic that will match this pack of belt the one nice thing if you're looking well actually you can't see it because I got scan disc up this case is actually not yellowed or if it is yellowed it's like so so minimally yellowed this one I think actually uh, okay, it probably is slightly yellowed, but it's in really good shape. I mean, there's some rust on the bottom of it. Probably it was uh, probably where it was sitting on a, a damp surface. But inside, though, I haven't seen any rust inside the case. It's like just the bottom of the case is rusted. So I guess maybe it was stored in a, I don't know, somewhere that maybe it got wet at some point on the bottom but otherwise was I guess con in a controlled enough environment that it didn't rust inside so maybe uh, I don't know maybe it was stored in a basement that had a dehumidifier running but maybe occasionally had moisture problems but yeah it's it's like I would say in this case is in really good shape, uh, all things considered, even if the power button is gone and filled in with some sort of glue. Other than that small deficiency, this case is in really good shape. A and I guess the rust on the bottom, but I can deal with that. I and I think it might be missing a foot. I can deal with that. The rust I can deal with, I'll probably like, oh, hey, Will Jr. 880. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the, the mic tech thing and doing a surface scan of this hard drive that was making some weird clunky noises. But, you know, now that I'm running this, I think I seemingly remember the Seagate drives, like the one that's in this computer, were more clunky than other drives, and I really didn't care for it back in the day. So I think the, the noise I heard was it just going to sleep mode, and then Windows 95 being Windows 95 was locked up until the drive spun up again. This computer... Uh, I think this computer is probably fine. I may, um... Yeah, yeah, um... Yeah, I'll get some color fab, too, someday. But the, the, po um, the poly maker will be good enough. Yeah, I should probably plug my GoTech in and uh, run a MIM test on this computer just to make sure the memory's good. Although, let me see if I can find the link that RetroTech Chris sent me. I don't remember if he sent it to me by text or by Facebook Messenger or what Nope, okay, it wasn't by text. I got an exchange between Chris and I. I was talking about some LTEs I picked up on eBay, the place where I buy things I later regret. You can probably take from my comment that maybe I did, uh, did regret those LTEs for some reason. They'll be on the channel at some point. And, uh, uh, yes, Jesse, I did get your package. It's, uh, 
safely stowed away with my LTEs for when those come out to play on the stream. So thank you for sending that power adapter along. Um, but yeah, I got it. I got it yesterday. Here we go. Yep, just sent it to me by Facebook Messenger because it's a link to the Facebook group for Packard Bells. Can't see that. Ah. ah, good night, gut bomb. Oh, good. Excellent. So we had a, a lost cluster. I don't have the link to read the tattoo off this drive. Read. After Bell Tattoo. Here we go. Here we go. I think I found a... <sighs> Alright. Well, I'll have to find the instructions. I I don't have a link, so... Alright, good night, Eric. But anyways, oh, you know, let's see, um, actually, wait, I already looked. There was no, no, uh, games on this computer. Pity, pity. All right, let me, let me do something here. I should probably get one of those. I think someone sent Adrian Black a, like, a plug with a switch on it. You can plug into a power outlet for switching things that don't have switches. And it's like, I'm going to need to get one of those for this. But, all right. So I'm going to borrow the floppy cable here real quick. And let me borrow the power. And... My go tech up real quick. Let's see here. And I'll end the stream running a one quick diagnostic here. I can find the thumb drive that goes on my go tech. go. Oh, I'm probably going to have to go into BIOS and change the boot order. Although this is really cool. I know Packard Bells aren't everyone's cup of tea, but
considering I only paid five bucks for this, I think it was a good deal. Because in, in all technicality, the tower that I put the 486 in, that I paid $10 for because that was like the first computer I found. Oh, it just fooled me. And then the, uh, then I paid, uh, I asked if I could get the Packer Bell for five more because the seller saw me staring at it. And then the G3 for five more, so. So yeah, this Packard Bell cost me five whole dollars. The case is a great, well, other than the power button. So I can overlook the, the power button issue for $5 for an entire Pentium 75 system with a working hard drive. I, I think I can tolerate the power button issue. So just trying to check the chat there real quick. Yeah, I'm going to run a, going to let this run a memory test just to make sure the memory is good. So this system, I will probably, I think I will probably replace the, the fast page memory with EDO memory because this, it has EDO and fast page mixed. Because quite honestly, I could, would like to swipe the fast page memory to put in an older system since this system supports EDO. So I'll probably do that, but otherwise I think I may just leave it at 24 megabytes because that's actually a decent amount of memory. I may upgrade the video memory to 2 megabytes. I may not. I don't know. Um, I may just kind of... I may actually try to find a hard drive closer to the original size of it. I may try to find a quad speed CD-ROM. I might make it look like the one we had. But then again, if this... CD-ROM works. I may just leave it alone. Because quite honestly, I wouldn't mind just keeping it a $5 Packard Bell system. Other than maybe fixing the power switch. And I might, I might replace this Seagate that makes weird noises with a compact flash card. Just because uh, reliability... And this isn't the original hard drive of the system. And yeah, I probably will just swap the fast page out for EDO so I can put the fast page in something else. Especially if I figure out... Um, I'll have to figure out which one's the fast page. It'll probably be obvious when I look in it. But the thing is, I probably have on hand EDO to replace the fast page. So it's not like I'll have to spend any more money. In fact, actually, I probably picked up EDO modules at the swap meet that will directly replace the fast page in the system. So if if that's the case, then I can it'll just be my swap meet Packard Bell. Oh, hey, Retro Tech Chris. Yeah, you're you're late again, but. Um, you missed the, uh, uh, working late again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Jesse's saying you can't get a foot long from Subway for that much anymore. Yeah. I bet you can't. Uh, Jack 68 K says, and since you didn't buy it on eBay, it's not a purchase you regret. Yeah, uh, that's indeed true. Yeah. So Chris, this is the Packard bell. It, it booted to windows 95. Uh, the power switch is has been replaced with a blob, like, filled in with hot glue or something. It's like, I think the plastic button broke and someone hot-rigged it to be always on. So I'm going to have to fix that, but the Seagate hard drive works. I pulled up the Packard Bell profile app that tells you about your system. And it does look like this hard drive has the tattoo on it because it was telling me things that I don't think it would have said otherwise. So I'll have to get the program and uh, put it on a disc, I guess, to read the tattoo. Uh, because I, I think I probably will run the restore that you, because you pointed me to the restore CD. So I probably will restore it because there is some, uh, there are a few directories on this hard drive that lead me to believe there potentially could be HIPAA protected data on it. So I'm going to wipe this 
sooner rather than later. Let's just say that I uh, there were like two directories I don't want to open because one was called Nurse and the other was also leading me to believe it might have been something healthcare related. So, although then again, there was a document I briefly saw in the documents directory that made it look like maybe it was a biology teacher and not a medical healthcare, but it could have also been a nurse at a school. So yeah, I'm going to wipe this drive sooner rather than later. So I'll be running restore on it. Yeah, but it, it like powered up a lot. The real time clock's dead. So I'm going to have to replace that. But yeah, it powered up. I guess whoever upgraded the hard drive ran the Packard Bell restore. So I, they probably did it when the real time clock would have still had the tattoo information programmed in it. So when they ran the restore program, it would have restored it to the hard drive. So that's good. So I have a copy of it. Oh, and the program to create the restore disks is also on here, but I don't know if the images are still on here. I may, uh, I may have to try running that out of curiosity. But yeah, this, uh, oh yeah. And Chris, you missed, uh, I finally put the 486 in a case. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you, I'll have to send you a picture. So yeah, Chris, that that generic tower I got at the swap meet uh, that you can't see because the Packard Bell would be in the way. It's now my 486. So I put my uh, the 486 board and it's got the Mach 64 Visa local bus card in it. So I actually now have a 486 in a case. And I put the uh, Cyrix processor I got from Jeremy in it. So it's actually a really I got a really nice little 486 tower. So, yeah, I decided after evaluating the cases I had, since the Pentium board that was in that case has a failed IDE channel, I decided to just go ahead and uh, turn it into a 486. Obviously, I've got, here's the Pentium board. I'm going to put it in my repair pile, so I will take a look at it at some point and try to repair it. I mean, it is a halfway decent board, I think. It's got a VIA chipset, so not, like, the worst. But the IDE controller is probably integrated on the chipset, so it is quite possible I may not be able to fix the failure. But I'll try. Can't hurt to try. Or maybe I'll give it to someone that doesn't need two IDE channels on the, the main board. So I, I'll, I will look at it if it's obvious, if I find something obviously broken, I'll try to fix it, but I, I won't make it worse because at least still is a usable Pentium board. It's not halfway bad. So at, at least it's not a PC chips Pentium motherboard. So, but yeah. So yeah, that's the, um, oh yeah. And, uh, at least I did get the, uh, so this is the case badge that was on the Packard Bell. It still has the protective coating, or uh, the protective plastic on it. So I'm going to hold on to this for putting on a case that doesn't have a case badge. Because this is actually a metal case badge that probably came from back in the day from PC Warehouse. So I'm going to leave the pr plastic protective coating on it to protect it. So. And yes, I will take a picture of the case badge that was on my now 486. And I'll. I'll, I'll tag Geek and Spiel in the. Uh, in the social media, I'll, I'll post it to social media and tag Geek and Spiel and who knows, maybe they might reproduce the Max computers case badge because it actually is pretty neat. Now, granted. They'll probably do like the brushed metal plastic, I guess, domed plastic case badge. But still, I think it'd look pretty neat as a case badge. So I, I will do that and tag Geek and Spiel. Who knows? Maybe we might convince them to 
clone it and that'd be cool anyways so it is midnight i know a lot of these nights have been going way longer than midnight but i'm kind of tired of running a sleep deficit this week so i am going to go ahead and draw the stream to a close while the memory test continues to run because i don't probably because I, I do a few clean up things after the stream so that'll give time for the memory test to finish and i don't want to until i'm sure the packard bell power supply is not reefa free i don't want to let it run unattended so anyways be sure to smash that like button if you've liked this stream because it looks like i've had a success rate of 100 percent on the pc stream so i guess pc wins this week oh well uh, it, let me know if you like the concept of the Mac versus PC stream week. Because I've got more Macs to work on. Hey, uh, the Power Mac G3 is going to have to come back out. Uh, the, the, well, the Packard Bell, I'll have to restore it. But I got some other PC stuff to work on. So let me know if you like that. And maybe I'll do another, another Mac versus PC week sometime. Uh, do remember next week. Tuesday, I've got the SGI Octane scheduled for Street E286 Power, E286 power Supply. And uh, it looks like my connection glitched, so I do apologize about that, but that might also be a good sign for me to stop because Comcast might be having issues. Anyways, yeah, Jeremy's saying Bertha, question mark. Jeremy, there is no way I'm going to be able to drag Bertha over here to live stream it. Uh, Bertha's going to be a video because I, Bertha is not going to be able to come to me to the workbench. I am going to have to go to Bertha because there's not enough room for me to work on Bertha here. But anyways. Yeah, yeah, I, apparently I, I OBS connection glitch. So I'm going to take that as a sign that YouTube or Comcast is having troubles. So. At least I was wrapping the stream up anyways. I don't know what you missed because I didn't see when it started to glitch, but well, I hopefully didn't miss much. Anyways, yeah. So, um, oh, back 68 k I had to call, call your ISP today because your, your internet provider decided to spontaneously unregister your modem's MAC address. Oh, ugh. Oh. And Jesse says, but Comcast never has problems, says every AT&T U-verse customer from Chicago. <laughs> oh, oof. Uh, Jeremy, I would have to move, like, everything over to Bertha, and that's not going to happen. I got stuff tangled on this desk. Bertha will eventually happen. It's just going to be, it's a longer-term thing. Because also, uh, I was, yeah, Bertha will, I, I will eventually work on Bertha. It's just going to be a longer term thing. I, I kind of need to get a few projects done because then I might be able to actually work on it because I've got too many disassembled things on my workbench. So, ah, Jesse says Frontier was out in all of Wisconsin today. Oof. Jack 68K misses the one gigabit fiber he had at his old house. Not available here at the new house half a mile away. Yeah, that tracks. Anyways, great stream. Great successes. These computers will be back. The, the 486 will probably be back in a more fun, fun way because I, I think the build's complete. I, I, do need, uh, I do need to like do something about the top of the case, though, because it, it's got some rust on the top of the case. So I'll, I'll probably paint the, the metal part of the case that goes on the 486, but yeah, and I'll clean the dust out of it. But yeah, the 486 build, great. So don't be surprised if I update the thumbnail because, well, the computer looks different now. And yeah, that's great. And the Packard Bell works and the memory test is getting close. But anyways... I've tempted fate long enough. I'm going to go ahead and draw the stream to a close before Comcast decides to do it for me. Because at least if I do it on my own terms, then I get to show the credits. 
So take care, have a great rest of your day, and I hope to see you next time. Computer Ask Start is brought to you by my awesome patrons on Patreon and by your tips and memberships on coffee. These and other channel supporters make my live streams possible. You too can become a channel supporter with tiers starting at just $1. Don't forget to smash that like button. And if you've liked what you've seen, subscribe and turn on notifications so that you don't miss the next video or live stream. And as always, thank you for all your support. I hope to see you next time. And until then, take care.